Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of the 5-1 Speedway Show. Sorry it's been a long time since the last episode, which was with uh, young Sarah Cords, um, and hopefully managed to catch up with all the other episodes that we've done so far. Tonight my guest is uh, an Australian legend, he's a uh, 10 times Australian champion, he's won the World Team Cup, he's won uh, but you know, everything apart from the World Championship unfortunately, but he's the most smoothest guy in speed where he was. Please welcome to the show, Lee Adams. Hey mate, how are we going? Pretty good mate, pretty good, not bad. How you? How are you going? Uh, yeah, we're going okay. Obviously um, we're living in a strange world at the moment, so um it's pretty tough we, you know we're in lockdown again number five so um but look figures and everything are pretty good in australia we've managed to sort of keep it contained um obviously winter winter is just a killer because it kick it kicks off and it's pretty cold everyone thinks australia is just you know blazing sunshine and 40 <laughs> degrees but it's it's definitely not like that it's really cold and to, to be fair, today is just a shitty, windy, horrible day. So, um, yeah, we're in lockdown number five. So, um, you know, it's not ideal, but, um, you know, you guys have been there and done it. Everyone's been there and done mm. it. So you just got to get on with life and do what you can. Yeah, well, I think we've only had three major lockdowns over here. So we haven't had, the, we haven't had five yet, unfortunately. But um, hopefully come Monday, um, that we should be all back to some sort of normality over here. So fingers crossed. But uh, I hope so, yeah. I've been sort of keeping in tab with Speedway and obviously they've been restricted a little bit. I see the Car Grand Prix, Dean mm. Silverstone and big crowds and it's packed tomorrow and or today for you guys, yeah. um, which is really good to see. You guys are just getting on with it. Your vaccinations, you know, you're way ahead compared to us. Um, and, you know, your government seems like they're just getting on with it and dealing with it, basically. Obviously, you've got the problem of leading into winter and cold weather and, you know, it's a flu-related disease. So, yeah, um, yeah it's a tough one. And that's what we're in the middle of now, you know. So cold weather's kicked off in Sydney. We had removalists come down to Melbourne and then, yeah, the rest is history. So Yeah, that's unfortunate because, obviously, you know, it's like I say, it's a weird time. It's the weirdest time that everyone's ever known and stuff like that. Have you been able to actually get out of the house much in, in this lockdown or you literally can't leave the house at all then? No, we, we're pretty good. We, we're okay, really. Like, where I come from, I'm six hours from Melbourne, so six mm. hours north um we haven't had a case here for 14 months 15 months probably um so things are pretty good you know we just wear masks and all that sort of stuff the norm basically but um like, like in general it's just been pretty normal here and um you know i just go out the shed and bury myself in the shed and do my thing out there so um yeah it's um it's just it's yeah it's just tough it's it's you know, it's just the little things like we had a, a meeting tomorrow for the Junior Speedway mm. that gets cancelled. You know, it's a local football, all that sort of stuff. You know, mm. you guys have been through it. So, but um, yeah, what can you do? Exactly. What can you, you just have to ride the storm out, unfortunately, you know, and things like totally. that. Totally. But um, yep. so, so when you go in your garage, what do you normally end up doing? Do you end up building bikes or do you end up tink tinkering or what do you end up doing then? Well, oh, look, I'm doing. I, I, do a lot of dirt bikes obviously my son was a kdm mechanic um, in the local shop and he's now gone to work for husvana oh. um, so husvana australia he's he's the mechanic for the team um so yeah i've got a lot of dirt bikes i still build a few little junior speedo bikes not very many um you know i probably do about six or seven a year basically um again you know i got people wanting wanting the stuff but um COVID you know you're just trying to get it get get John to make it in England and then mm. obviously he can make it he can't get his chromas you know just it's a knock-on effect and then the freight and everything so I'm not really doing as many as what I'd like to but um I, I, I've got enough out there to keep me busy so that's good yeah that's the main thing keep you sane so to speak isn't it in this um in this weird time more than anything totally yeah look I, I could honestly say you know since my injury if I didn't have me shared Mm. I would have been going stupid, you know. I just go out there and do me thing, and um, you know, I've got my leg that I brought over from England. Mm. Uh, so I managed to get up and do a lot of stuff. I've got a bike bench, um, so I kind of get set up in the mornings, and then off I go and do me thing. And 
Um, yeah, look, without me shed, I, as I say, I'd be, um, you know, I'd be in a bad place, I reckon. Yeah, everyone needs a shed. That's what it is. That's what totally. you need. All you need is a shed. <laughs> totally, totally, 100%. Yeah, exactly. But um, what we're here tonight, Lee, is also to talk about your long and lustrous career in Speedway and everything. Um, so how did it all sort of like start for you? I mean, obviously, I know that um, you managed to come through the juniors and everything like that. But was you always a Speedway fan then or was you basically just went to it and watched? No, well, look, to, it all started from Phil Crump, basically. Um, he was the hero of the town. Speedway was massive in Mildura. It still is. Um and every Sunday we used to go along and watch Phil, you know, do his thing. And, um, you know, it was always a, a thing, you know, when you become good enough, you wanted to get to England because Phil had kind of passed the way, um, you know, obviously Streety helped him get to England, but um, he was sort of the local boy that first went over and, and did his thing over there. So, um, you know, from my career, it started in the junior speedway, um, nine to 16. And then went into seniors. I did a couple of years, or a year and a half, I think. And then Neil Street sort of picked me up and saw me and and um, and wanted me to go to pool. So um, I flew over, did a month over there and had a look. And then the next year I came over permanently. But yeah, look, it was all it was all from Phil basically. He he paved the way for for all everybody that's going now. Um, you know, JMO and and Seji and all those guys. So. Um, you know, we've had a, a lot of guys come over or go over from Mildura. Um, you know, as I say, Speedway is pretty popular here. It, it still is now, you know, we still get good crowds and, you know, we're producing not the quantity of riders I'd like to, but mm. we still produce some quality, you know, which is really cool. Yeah, I mean, with the latest batch of um, Aussies coming over, like I said, Jamin Lindsay and uh, Justin Sedgman, just to name but a couple, but, you know, they're hitting the ground running and sort of going with it. I mean, especially Jamin Lindsay after winning the World Under 21s last year and now caught completely in Poland, Sweden. Unfortunate ride in England, but he's doing well on the continent nowadays. So that must have put some sort of, like, pride into yourself, like yourself, like say, Phil Crump paved the way for yourself. You probably, you and Jason probably paved the way for him and for, for Jamin to come on to England as well and things like that, so... Yeah, yeah, look, he's a he's a, a massive talent. Um, he actually, you know, we, he come through the junior speedway with my son, Declan. Oh, okay. um, it was weird. We had we got a, a the local uh, secondary school. There was about five or six kids that all went to the same school and were pretty much in the same grade. I think Jamo was a year younger. Mm. Um, but we had sort of five or six all all doing junior speedway, which was great, you know. And and the junior speedway was real solid then. Mm. Um, you know, Jamo was pretty motivated. He couldn't get a work permit, couldn't get to England. So he, he came to me and said, what do you think? I said, well, you know, what about Poland? So he, he said, yeah, definitely. You know, you get me in there. So... Um, just with my contacts through Lesno, through Paul Copper, um, you know, they took him on as an unknown, basically. Mm. He, he really hadn't done his apprenticeship through England. Um, and I said, mate, the kid's good. And, you know, Peter took him on and, and housed him. And, um, and now he's paying him back because mm. he's, you know, he's, he's definitely uh, the talent. He's the, the future, basically. So... Yeah, look, he um, he looks really good. He's a, he's a good kid and and you know self motivated really. You know, it was it was his idea to go to pole and he come to me and said, you know, listen, I can't get a work permit. What else can I do? You know, so um, yeah, he's going to be good. Yeah, well, he looks good now. So fingers crossed, he'll be even better in the future. So, but um... yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I mean, I remember seeing him um, or reading about him in the Speedway Star going to like Lejeune and places like that. I thought, well, maybe that's the Lee Adams effect straight away sort of thing there. It was straight to Lejeune, you know, and things like that. So obviously that's true then. So Yeah, yeah, exactly. Look, we, um, you know, with my contacts, you know, I still keep in touch with all the guys at Lesno, Igwa, Paul Copper and all those guys. Um, you know, and they're, you know, they're, they're in a really good position because they've got Ravich as a second division. It's a feeder. Mm -hmm. Um, so they've sort of taken, they took Jamo on and Kino Ru and um, a few others. So, you know, really good position they're in. And, and you know, as I say, obviously, Jamo is paying them back now. He's, he's, you know, scoring really good points in the first division or the elite or whatever. Yeah. I'm not really up with it, now, how, <laughs> what it's called. So, but yeah, no, he's, he's a great talent. Mm, yeah, definitely. And definitely want to watch for the, hopefully, the Grand Prix series in the future and things like that. 
Yep, yep, yeah. definitely. But going back to obviously talking about your juniors quickly, let's go back to that. I mean, I see in one notes you managed to win the um, under 16 pairs and the under 16 senior championship at junior level. Um, so it must have been a great sort of start for yourself just to sort of like kickstart yourself into this big wide world of speedway then. Yeah, look, our junior speedway, it was so good back then and it still is really good. You know, I, I, I think it's the best feeder um, system for speedway in the world. Um, our little bikes are really cool. Tracks are great. Really teaches the guys, uh, one, how to turn the bike and two, throttle control. So, um, you know, back in the day, yeah, I was on a bike, on a junior speedo bike when I was nine. Um, it was, it's not really until your latter years when you're sort of 14, 15, you sort of, you get your confidence to win and you manage to win a, a junior championship um which was really cool i, I mm. can't i think it was in Mordura actually so that was probably even better mm. um managed to get best pairs and a few others so yeah and you know as i say we we're still producing good good riders mm. um i'd like to see a lot more basically yeah well obviously i think once that production line and once this obviously there's covid passes and everything else and all the visas and everything all sorted out i think then you'll probably see a lot more aussies coming over because obviously you've like got max frick doing well so got doily doing well chris holders on the revival sort of thing so there's all the inspiration yeah. for these young kids to come through now more than anything yeah totally totally yeah definitely exactly so obviously when you dipped your first toe into the national league as it was then with um with paul and everything what was your sort of first impressions then of coming over to england and then obviously doing your season uh you know what it, it, it's kind of um you know when you come to england you just my first impressions were especially sitting back here you know Mordura's it's pretty rural and you know we've got loads of room to go motorbike riding and play and whatnot and i kind of had this thing in my mind that england was just going to be built up everywhere you know there was yeah. going to be no no paddocks or <laughs> you know anything like that so when i landed and i was driving down a pool and you know seeing all these wheat paddocks and all that i thought ah, oh, that's you know that's pretty cool um obviously pool pool was was pump, pumping then you know we had massive crowds and boise and the langdons and um, you know, there was a really strong Australian contingent, New Zealand um, also. So, but yeah, very lucky to get linked up with Streety and uh, Streety took me under his wing and I stayed with him my first year. Um, you know, that was massive to be, you know, in a family environment and whatnot. So, um, you know, and, and traveling around, that's the thing is, you know, there's not that many traffic jams in England and or in Australia, sorry, and not that much traffic. So to get over there and be on a motorway and all that, so <laughs> it was a bit of a culture shock. But um, yeah, look, loved it. Um, won my league in my first year at Pool. Um, you know, really couldn't have asked for a better year, really. No, exactly. And it's um, crazy to think that, like you say, your debut year, you know, you managed to win the National League. But like you said, it's like a home way from home because you've got the Langdons, you've got Boise, you've got Neil Street team manager. So near enough, it's like a, a Team Australia type of thing already. You know, so you're in with a good environment of riders, hence the reason probably why you won the league. But what, what, did you have um, Roscoe in the team as well at that time? Alan Roster? Uh, we did, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was my um, that was my introduction to Roscoe my, my first year over. He was captain. Um, didn't really realize that he just dropped down from the elite league or, you know, um, what do you call it? The premiership or whatever yeah. it is now. So, um, yeah, he just dropped down, uh, become captain of cool and obviously, you know, a real character of the sport and, you know, I come in pretty green and didn't know what the, the deal was, but, um, got to know him and got to become really good friends. And obviously he went on to be team manager for me. So yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, but that's weird when you look back at it, thinking, oh, he kept me teammate and then he's my boss sort of thing. You think, hang on, it's a bit weird, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, look, and, and, you know, I lived in Swindon pretty much, you know, my whole career. Um, you know, my first year I was exited and and pretty much 20 years uh, lived in Engl lived in Swindon. So, yeah. um, you know, I was always down the pub and, you know, socialising with him and got to, got to become really good friends with him, you know, and... Uh, yeah, but uh, for him to be captain and then be me team manager, yeah, a little bit weird. And uh, but it, you know, he do, he did a great job and still is doing a really good job with everything. So um, yeah, 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, obviously, after that first year of National League, you went to the British League in 1990 with, with your first spell at Swindon. I mean, that must have been uh, a bit of a, of a, um, like a strange decision because most riders would have done two years in National League and then probably gone up to the British League. What was your sort of thinking then, staying with, uh, not staying with Paul then, going up with uh, Swindon? Yeah, look, it was it was maybe um, a little bit premature, I think. Um, when now now looking back, you know, hindsight's a wonderful thing. Mm. Probably two years apprenticeship would have been fantastic, but um, it was actually at the end of that year, um, a, a sponsor of mine, um, Pete Summers, used to do ignition boxes. He was sponsoring Hans Nilsson. I actually went to his house and had lunch with Hans and. You know, Hans was the king king back then. He was world champion. Yeah. And uh, to go to his house and see his workshop and all that sort of stuff, it was, you know, incredible. And he just said to me, he said, man, you need to get up. You need to go up as quick as you can and get up into the elite league, you know. Yeah. So so he kind of, um, you know, fed the the reason for going. Um, but look, looking back in hindsight, two years apprenticeship would have been fine. And, and then I probably would have, you know, stayed at pool and, you know, you know, my my career would have been probably a little bit different, but um, you know, I wouldn't change it for the world. I had it was difficult. I, I I must admit that it was really tough because I came in to Swindon. We had a mediocre team. It was you know not too bad, um, mm. but I came in at number seven, and I think I ended up at number two or three in the averages. I think I was riding number two with Jimmy Nelson. You know, so. That was tough, you know, that was a really hard thing. And then our team sort of depleted. So I was kind of kind of propping it up a little bit, you know. So that was really hard. That was um that was pretty grinding. So but um look, I wouldn't change I, I you know, in hindsight, yeah, two years, do your apprenticeship, stay in Premier League and and then drop and then go up to your league. But um you know, I managed to to get to swim and get in the elite league and, and, you know, mix it with the big boys, basically. Yeah, and you basically did your sort of, like, apprenticeship then from those early years at Swindon because obviously unfortunately Swindon struggled for a few years um, and then in 92 you got relegated in the battle between my club Eastbourne and I think Arena Essex in the 92 season and things like that um, but yep. also also in that 1990 year you managed to make the overseas final um, and so you got your first sort of taste of world championship speedway really. Yeah look you know it was always a thing the Commonwealth you had to go well, it all started back in Australia. You had mm. to do your state title, the Aussie title. Then it went Commonwealth overseas, and then you went on to the Intercontinental or something mm. like that. Um, yeah, got, got a little taste for it. Um, you know, you probably go in a little bit green and think it's going to be pretty easy, but it wasn't. It was far from that and, mm. and struggled me first couple of years. I think I, I bombed out of me Commonwealth first or overseas mm. or something. Um but yeah, always tough meetings. You know, I think there was one in Cov or a couple in Cov, and uh, then it went to Kings Lynn. So mm. um, always really tough. It was always a real battle just to make my first world final, which was in I can't remember in Germany somewhere. Um, Pocking ninety three. Pocking, Pocking. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, mm. exactly. So um, you know, it was always a battle, big time. Yeah, I can imagine it was because I've got the, the DVDs, those sort of meetings, and the racing's fantastic, but the lineups as well, you know, they were again world finals or world semi finals all over, sort of thing. So they were really tough meetings and things like that. But you managed to get your sort of again, you managed, managed, managed to make one final in 1990. I know that because I've got it on, uh, I've got it here for you to have a look at, which was the World Pairs final you managed to make with uh, uh with, with, with Toddy. Uh, uh, that was um. Yeah, that was mad, really. It was, um, we we went in there as sort of unknowns, really. And mm. um, I think it was the old day six riders, uh, six rider format. It was, yes. Um, yeah, and yeah, brutal meeting, you know. And mm. uh, Toddy was on fire then, basically. And, uh, you know, I was just picking up the pieces, basically. <laughs> and, uh, you know, obviously Todd was just renowned for his starting and whatnot, so... Um, yeah, we managed to, we, we actually pushed it right to the end mm. with the Danes and, uh, and nearly won the whole thing. So, um, yeah. yeah, yeah, that was unbelievable, unbelievable. Yeah. But yeah, look, Todd, Todd just, you know, he was just on fire back then. 
yeah, smoked you straight away sort of thing. But no, but I mean, it's like you say, you came so close. It was between yourself, Denmark and Hungary, I think it was for the title in the end. And the Danes picked you by like a point, I think it was in, in the final sort of thing. But uh, still must have been great experience though for yourself at this young age. Yeah, it was. Yeah, definitely. But, um, you know, it would have been nice, nice to, uh, but you can see here, Todd's sitting, sitting back looking for me, basically. Yeah. But, um, yeah, look, you know, really cool experience. My father was over then, actually, and, mm. and travelled over to it. So that was really cool. Yeah. Like I say, it's the six-man six, six man, um, races, which were... I, I remember in your first race, I think you got wiped out in your first ride um, with, with yep. Gerd Riss and things like that. I mean, it's crazy because obviously Landshut is a narrow track, you know, and you think, well, it's a bit sketchy having six riders going around that track. Yeah, it was. I, I You know, some of the some of the ideas were, you know, a little bit stupid, but um, yeah, it was, it was a big pileup. I think it was like four guys went down in the first corner or something like that. So, you know, six riders really, you know, go to part of beats, big track, yeah. you know, big wide track, not a problem. So um, yeah, landship was pretty tough. Yeah, it was tough, but that, that, I thought I'll show you that one because it might give you back a few memories of that sort of meeting, you know, and that sort of thing. That's pretty cool. But um, obviously then moving on, say, 91 and 92 was unfortunately a struggle for Swindon um, and things like that. I think surviving relegation in 91, but then going down in 92, which obviously then left you as a free agent for 1993, um, which obviously eventually went to Arena. But didn't you have troubles of even getting a club at the start of 93? Yeah, yeah, I did. I was without a club. I, I flew over. Um, you know, didn't get signed up by anybody. Coventry was still looking for somebody. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of I hinged, hinged on getting that job and it fell apart the last minute. They ended up taking hands, I think. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I was out. I think I was out for a good couple of months or a, it was definitely six, six weeks or something. And then Ivan and Terry, you know, they were running Arena Essex and um, Ivan come in and said, what do you think? I said, yeah, you know, and look, it, um, it was great. It was obviously a bit of a killer, the drive there, you know, getting around the M25 on a Friday. <laughs> yeah. um, that, that wasn't ideal, but, um, you know, other than the drive, I absolutely loved it. You know, it was a really cool track and it was a good home track. You know, it was, um, it was really enjoyable and, and Ivan and Terry were great promoters, and you know, as I say, I really loved it. It was um, it was a real family fam family atmosphere. Um, you know, Andy Golvin was living with Terry and uh, Josh um, Larson and Bo Peterson were both living with Ivan. Yeah. So yeah, it was um, it was great. I really enjoyed it there. Yeah, because I imagine it's the sort of track that sort of suited your style. Obviously, again, Mildura being a small sort of track, you know, so it was like a home away from home for you, really, because as a home track. Yeah, like trying to turn a bike was not a problem, was never a problem for me, you know, and, and especially Mildura was pretty long, straight, tight corners, mm. you know, grippy, all, all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, it was never an issue, but... Um, yeah, I think we did two years there and then it went a little bit sour because we ended up going to London mm. for a year. They transferred everything to London, um, you know, and then it just went pear-shaped from there, basically. <laughs> that was that just didn't happen, you know. Mm. It was um, unfortunate. It was beautiful stadium in the wrong place, basically. Mm. Um, and we really struggled and struggled to get crowds. And, um, yeah, it was a tough, tough one, um, yeah. Yeah, that's all unfortunate. But obviously, in that sort of time, you individually you were doing well because you managed to claim your Aussie Championship. Your, I think you came two by that time, two or three. And then obviously, then the Grand Prix all started kicking off and all that sort of thing. So, you know, and obviously, but also you made your first world final in 93. Do you remember much about that day in Pocking at all? Oh, yeah, I do. I, um, you know, I was probably underprepared <laughs> and, you know, just, yeah. Um, and probably just, you know, looking at guys' names, basically, and, and not really writing to your potential sort of thing. So, um, yeah, it was a tough one. Obviously, everybody goes through it. You, it's like an apprenticeship, isn't it? The the Speedway GPs and all that yeah. sort of stuff. you just got to build up to it. But, um, yeah, it was a tough, tough day. Tough track. The, the tracks in Germany, I just found really difficult. You know, yeah. they were slick, flat. Um, you know, I used to love a bit of banking, a little bit of grip and stuff like that. So, 
um, yeah, it was a tough one. Well, the year before, in 1992 in Germany, you had a good day by winning the World on 21s. So it can't have been all that bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, yeah. So th- to be, that was a total different ball game. That was a mm. big sand track, grippy. Um, it rained like I can remember. You know, it was weird. I was so focused on winning the thing, and it absolutely tipped down like before the meeting. And and normally, like now, you'd sit back and think, oh, this is going to get called off, you know. But it didn't even go through my brain. It was just like, man, I'm going to win this thing. You know, that's just you know. I put the blinkers, put the blinkers on, and just marched on with it. Um, you know, really cool meeting. Went down to a runoff with Mark Lorem. Mm. Um, managed to sneak that one, and you know that was that was great because I missed the world championship that year. So mm. I kind of really had to sit back and go, okay, listen, this is all, all I got left. Mm. Put everything into it, you know. So um, yeah, it was it was really nice to win that one and and uh you know when same old thing you just put everything into it and when you walk away with it it's um you know you you tick the box basically yeah was that your first attempt at the world on 21 final as well or was that had you done one previous to that uh i had done one down in lanigo oh, okay um probably the, i think the year before or something like that um mm. Yeah, so I went down to Lonigo. That actually, that was one that got washed out. It, it oh. got rained out. It just, it was unbelievable, mate. I've never seen anything like it. It just rained for like three days, three days straight down there. We didn't get practice, and then it just mm. kept raining. So they actually called the meeting off, and we had to go back for it. So, oh. um, but yeah, look, you know, when I when I say about the the tracks in Germany. The the old chings and all those, you know, they were just big, flat, slick ones. Mm. Um, Farkirchen was was really different. It was a big, deep sand track, you know, very similar to Muldura, basically. Mm. Um, so, sorry, Pfaffenhofen. Mm. Pfaffenhofen. I'm getting all my meeting, <laughs> my uh, race tracks mixed up. No, it's easy done, easy, especially when they sound the same and things like that as well. That's fine. Totally, totally, <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah, but obviously then that was obviously great for you individually. Obviously then puts you back on the map sort of thing and saying, oh, I am the man to be, to be sort of signed for, for here, there and everywhere. Because um, I, I imagine that Poland was just opening up and things like that in the early 90s. And, uh, and obviously when you were with um, Hans at Pila, weren't you, for a few years and things like that. So it must have been nice for yourself. Yeah, look, Poland had just opened up and um, they, they'd kind of taken that... They'd, each club would take a, an A and a B rider, basically. Mm. Um, and I was really, really fortunate to link up with hands and go to Lublin, it was. was um, it? Yeah, Lublin. So, um, you know, great. I got to travel with hands and, you know, meet him at the airport and travel with him. And uh, just, to, just to hang with the guy and see how the guy tick was, was so cool, you know. So I think I did two years there and then hands transferred on and went to Piwa. After that, and I stayed on for one more year. So, um, but yeah, great times back then. And obviously, we were traveling. You know, back then it was communist, and travel wasn't. Uh, it was tough. Mm. And and being Australian, it was even tougher. I needed visas everywhere we went, and all that sort of stuff. So, it made it pretty difficult. Um, you know, we we're always down the embassies, down trying to get a French visa or a, a Polish or, you know, all those all those foreign countries, everywhere we went, we had to go and get visas. So, um, yeah, the guys don't realise how lucky they are now. It's 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 free for all. So. Mm. Yeah, it's easy travel nowadays compared to what you guys went through and things like that. I mean, crazy, crazy to think time. of that. But, um, yeah, I mean, obviously, like you said, you managed, you were riding, you're doing what you did for so many years later, was riding here, there and everywhere, you know, and stuff like that. So, I mean, that must have been kind of kind of cool to be like living the dream sort of thing, spirit rider, going to like Poland on a Sunday, England for most of the week, and then Sweden, and then back and backwards and forwards. It must have been knackering, but good fun to do at the time. Yeah, look, um, you know, I kind of, I feel pretty privilege you know we hit speedway right at the right time when mm. gps were kicking off and and obviously tony tony coming in and and sweden and all that and i managed to link up and ride for for masana when when tony was you know the, the king of sweden basically mm. um so yeah we we kind of we struck it right and obviously gps you know we're, we're starting to kick off and uh, we'll go into some fantastic stadiums 
Poland, you know, they'd just come out of communists and crowds were phenomenal. So, mm. yeah, we had some great times. Um, travel, travel, I got sick of in the end. That was, <laughs> that was, a, that was tough going. Um, you look, it was pretty good. It was pretty good at the stage where we were doing, uh, we'd do Poland Sunday and then we'd fly to Sweden um, pretty much Monday morning and then do Sweden Tuesday, come back, do pool Wednesday, mm. you know, follow on from that, basically. It was when kind of Sky Television come in and we had loads of Mondays back in England. Um, that was really tough. I found that really difficult because you'd go to Poland Sunday, you'd have to fly back Monday, do a, a telly, straight back into Sweden, back mm. into England. And then, you know, I was probably at Swindon back then, do Swindon Thursday bang straight friday morning go into a gp so mm. yeah it was it was a tough gig you know people kind of look at it and think oh it's pretty glamorous lifestyle but um you know it was it was playing trains and automobiles basically and uh but hey you wouldn't change it for the world you know when you when you're making a living out of something that you love and your sport um you know you wouldn't change it at all definitely no, I can imagine you wouldn't do. I mean, that was the sort of time when I was growing up was through all that sort of thing. And obviously seeing yourself ride, because my local club's Eastbourne, seeing you ride around Eastbourne yep. and places like that, you know, especially when it came to the uh, the, the Reno rivalry, the Kings Lynn rivalry, and you know, every other team you rode for was rivalry with Eastbourne at that time, you know, and stuff like totally, that. Totally, totally. You know, it's, um, it's, it was cool to see and all that sort of thing. But obviously I can imagine like, oh, we'll, we'll come, come up to this later on, but um, when the GPs changed from six rounds to 11 or 12 rounds, I can imagine that was a nightmare because it went from probably every sort of like four to six weeks of Grand Prix and it was every other week was the Grand Prix sort of thing. So I can imagine that was hectic. Yeah, it was like, you know, it went from kind of six to bang straight to 10 or 11 or something mm -hmm. like that. So, you know, it was always a tough gig. It was, and as I say, I was, I was at Swindon in those days. So Swindon was Thursdays. Mm -hmm. So it was always do Swindon wake up early straight to Heathrow get an early flight and again GPs you know back then we had like a, a 10 30 or a 11 o'clock sign on for the GP oh. you know so it was mad I can remember you know you'd always be on edge just trying to get out of the airport and and get to the track and whatnot so again the, the GPs now they got a night practice I think and they don't even actually have to do practice so back then it was compulsory you had to sign on and be there mm. so yeah times have changed and and for the good so yeah I guess that you guys have got the learning curve you know you used users like test pilots and it changed it ever since then sort of thing <laughs> yeah look that that came down to tracks also you know mm. back in our day you know, we were the pioneers of all the man-made ones going to Cardiff and, and yeah, look, don't get me wrong. You know, it was fantastic to go to Cardiff and all of the, and all those great stadiums, but track wise, man, I tell you, some of the tracks that, that Ollie served up to us, uh, were, mm -hmm. you know, the first one in Cardiff, I can remember him walking out and, and actually the ruts were that deep that had gone down to the plastic. And he mm -hmm. went out and cut the plastic away, you know, um, where the where you could see the hole. So, but that's you know we just sort of put up with it, and mm -hmm. you know we're in front of big crowds and in these you know world famous stadiums, you know. But uh, yeah, tracks were diabolical then. These guys <laughs> don't realise how lucky they are now. It's it, it you know I see the tracks that they dish up and and you know fantastic. The the product is you know, just coming leaps and bounds big time. Yeah, because the one track that sort of sticks out in my mind is sort of like one of the bad early days of the Man Main Wall was the one in Berlin in 2001, where it rained all day and everything. And uh, it, I think I think the practice on the Friday, it was in glorious sunshine. And then the next day, it absolutely rained for the whole meeting and the track got worse and worse and worse. I mean, obviously you rode in that meeting. How bad was it? <laughs> uh, there were some, there were some horrors, well, horror ones, mate, like a... <laughs> You know, we went to Gothenburg and and you come boring down the straight and you could hardly turn. They actually had to call that one off, you know. But um, yeah, the one in the one in Berlin, it just didn't stop raining and and Ollie's there, you know. Come on, boys, you know, let's go, let's get on with it, let's get it out of the way. And you know, yeah, just um, you know, frustrating it was. But um, 
you know, as I say, the GPs were, were kicking off and, and crowds were good, sponsors were good and mm -hmm. telly was, you know, really going in leaps and bounds. So we just sort of rode the wave, basically. You just went along with it. But, um, you know, I got probably a little bit frustrated in the end just with a lot of the tracks um, in the GP. We go to tracks like Big Gosh, which to me, one of the best racing tracks in the world when I went there for a league match. And I'd go for a GP and it would be like a concrete, you know, just a motorway and you couldn't pass and do things, you know. The, the, the times you'd try and pass people, you'd actually get past, you know, and, and that really frustrated me and that kind of, that kind of burnt me out basically and, and that's why I kind of bailed out of the GPs. I just got frustrated mm -hmm. with, with tracks and, and whatnot. But, um, yeah, and, and pretty much from when I finished in the GPs, um, that next year, Ollie retired and Tony came in, Tony yeah. Olsen. Um, and I was sitting back watching these tracks and they're like really cool, you know. And I was thinking, <laughs> oh man, what have I done? What have I done? You know, that's the way it goes. Yeah, it is the way it goes, and unfortunately, stuff like that. But, um, you know, perhaps then that maybe could have, if you weren't thinking of retiring, you could have thought, oh, get back in the Grand Prix. The tracks have got better now. You know, could have got back into it, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, look, and and definitely, um, you know, at the time when you're doing the GPs, you just think there's no chance you can't drop out, you can't drop yeah. out. But when you when I actually finished and you sit back and look at it, you know, even if you had a taken a year off and and just stayed in Australia and went back, recharged the batteries and go again, it wouldn't have been a problem. I, I, you know, you probably probably wouldn't finish up totally, but um, to finish the GPs for a year and then step back into it, no big deal. It would have um, would have charged the batteries and off I went, I think. But um, hindsight's a wonderful thing. It is a wonderful thing. But going, just going back to your, um, the British League again, um, obviously, like I say, 90, uh, 95 used the last year at Arena and then 96 was on to London, which is also, again, talking about the Grand Prix, was your first year in the Grand Prix series, um, which was a struggle, I think it was, if I remember right, because you won the Grand Prix Challenge in the Nego in 95. Um, yep. Then came, came in with, uh, I think it was Jason was also one of the newbies at the time in 96 and things like that. So it must have been a, an eye-opener just even qualifying for the Grand Prix series and then obviously then getting into it. But then obviously your home track was London, British Grand Prix. You must have thought, oh, I've got a chance of winning this one. Yeah, look... Um yeah <laughs> always a battle always a battle my first few years in the gps were just a battle anyway you know just to stay in there and i always struggled to stay in the top eight i think it was and yeah. always had to go to the challenge i think probably three years in a row i went to the challenge and you know they were the most cutthroat meetings ever it was top four or top three or something yeah. like that always a battle obviously going to london my home home track and yeah but it just didn't turn out basically, um, you know, that was a tough track. It was, you know, it was uh, pretty flat. And I, I'm not sure whether that was the night it really poured with rain. Can't remember. Um, that, that was, but anyway. um, that was 95 when it rained hard. Cause that's where the, uh, that's, that's what, crumpy that's was the wild one. card. Yeah. That's like it. That. That's mm. the one. Yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah, look, to be honest, my first few years in the GP were, were a battle anyway, you know, mm. they were really hard and, um, I wasn't kind of prepared mentally, basically, you know, I could, I could ride a bike and ride a bike fast enough, but, um, you know, you had to sort of believe that you could beat those guys and, mm. and, and I didn't have that self-belief back then. Mm. Yeah. Cause I think I remember rightly, um, off the top of my head, I think 90, the first round was in Rotslav and that's when you had the ABCD final and I think you were in the D final yep. and it rained hard before the finals and then I think you, Marvin Cox and Crumpy all came together uh, going down the, down to the turns three and four and kind of knocked you a bit silly. And that's it. And went down to I reserve. broke my collarbone. Oh, was yeah, it? I broke oh, okay. my collarbone. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I broke my collarbone, so that was a great start to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it must. Yeah, great start because obviously then that, that time that's when you uh, got knocked down to the reserve for the following round. So that's it. You went to Lanigo, track record holder. Everything was set up for you to do well at Lanigo, and your reserve. You think, oh bloody hell, here yeah, we go yeah. again. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, but that's just GPs, isn't it? You know, they're pretty brutal. Exactly. Um, I've actually got a bit of footage of um, you riding for the London Lines. Um, it's against well, London against Cradley, um, and it's uh, quite a good one because it shows, obviously, like I say, the the shape of the track and like how how good it could have been 
that, at that place now. I think you're gate number four in this one. Uh, you've That's got it. Les Collins, Alan Morgridge, and Dalla Anderson in this one. So, um, yeah, and I mean, so you can see how sort of flat it is and things like that. Because obviously, you would have probably ridden the old Hackney as well, maybe in the National League days. Yeah, I did. Yeah, that was, um, you know, that was that was pretty cool. That would, that had a lot of banking on it, you know. Mm. But um, yeah, we just needed a little bit more banking on this place, and and it was very narrow coming into the corners. Um, so that made it a little bit tough, but. Um, that was a shame because it had, had had everything going for it, didn't it? You know, it was yeah. a beautiful stadium and, um, you know, good pits and everything like that. But, um, yeah, just track-wise, just let it down, basically. Yeah, it's just unfortunate because, obviously, like I say, prime location, London, you know, it's got to be dragging everyone in, trying to get the sport but regenerated again in the 90s and things like that. Because, obviously, this was obviously the second year of one big league um, and things like that. So, obviously, travelling around the country would have been perfect at the time. Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah, it was a shame, you know, and, uh, you know, you couldn't fault Ivan and Terry. They put everything into it, but, mm. um, yeah, it just wasn't to be, really. And uh, it was a shame because Arena, I actually really enjoyed it. As I said before, I really enjoyed the place and enjoyed the track and, um, you know, and then to go there and, yeah, it was everything was a bit of a downer, basically, but mm. um, that's the way it goes. Yeah, it is the way it goes, unfortunately. And obviously, Unfortunately, London closed in 97 and then you went back to Swindon for two years. So that must have been nice to come virtually back home to Swindon. Yeah, look, I I, I, um, I didn't think it was ever going to happen, but, mm. um, you know, it managed to, to sneak back there and, and had a good couple of years there, you know, and I thought, this is it, you know, this is going to be, you know, the rest of my career basically there. And, uh I uh, didn't, it wasn't <laughs> to be. I think we got relegated again, did we? I know, I think or... Swindon dropped out because um, it, it was the time of the Elite League and everything had all changed, all the top boys were there. I think Swindon dropped down to go into the Premier League and then obviously yep. they no club 99. Uh, that's it. Yep, yeah, exactly. So, um, and then, yeah, off we off we go again, basically. Mm. And I think, I can't remember what it was, Kings Lynn and um, I did one a stint at Kings Lynn, mm. Oxford, um, pool and then obviously back to Swindon yeah yeah because obviously 99 was a bit of a, a strange year again like it was in 93 for yourself no club or anything but you were linked to Bellevue for a long time if I remember right in 99 and all of a sudden a last minute deal from Wag, Nigel Wagstaff got you to Kings Lynn yeah look to be to be fair I was I was talking to John Perrin mm. and we had kind of agreed a deal um, we hadn't signed anything or anything like that. And I'll be straight with you, Bellevue was not my favourite track. <laughs> it was a, I always struggled there, you know. Mm. But uh, yeah, and then, yeah, Nigel came in at the last minute, you know, and, and obviously Kings Lynn was probably one of my, definitely one of my favourite tracks in England. Um, he came in with the deal and yeah, we kind of, off we went, so... Hadn't signed a deal with John, but uh, yeah, we we were pr very close to agreeing. I, I was mm. just about there, basically. Yeah, and I can imagine John Perrin had been a bit slightly annoyed, you know, and probably gave you a hard time the next time he went there with Kings Lynn. <laughs> it wasn't a nice atmosphere the, the last time. Uh, the, the next time I went there, definitely. Yeah, you can imagine John, he's uh, he's pretty straight shooter. So, but um, yeah, no regrets. Go to go to Kings Lynn and and race on one of the best tracks, you know, in the country. It was awesome. And at that time was when you linked up with uh, a certain Tony Rickardson for the first time in the British League and things like that. So it must have been kind of cool to link up with him. Yeah, look, we it was weird. The first year, I think, um, we had such an awesome team at Kingsland mm. and everyone sort of put us down as crowd fav or um, favourites to win the league and... And it didn't happen. I think we won one knockout cup. What might have been the next year with Tony? We won the knockout cup because that was down at Eastbourne, wasn't it? I think uh, you, won, you didn't win anything in '99, but you won the knockout cup in 2000 with Jason and Boise and everyone in 2000. Um, uh, was it? Yeah. And then, yep. uh, and then Eastbourne <coughs> just pipped you to the league in 2000. Um, yep. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because that was in front of the, the Sky TV cameras at uh, that that meeting when there was a total uh, side. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah that one there. Yep, yep, I remember it. I remember. But yeah, look, happy days 
Kings Lynn, again, another big trip. Um, you know, it was a fair bit of travel just to get across there from Swindon. Mm. But, um, you know, to go there and race on that track every week, it's just your dream, basically. Yeah. So it didn't, the, the travel just went out the door. And yeah, I loved it. I, I actually really enjoyed, um, you know, going there. And, and we had good promoters and good people around us. And, you know, the mm. track was always beautiful. So um, happy days. Yeah, because at that time, when you sort of moving clubs in Sweden, you went to Masana in 2000 um, to link yep. up with Tony again. And obviously, that's obviously probably kick-started your Swedish career again, sort of thing. So obviously, at that time, you've ridden for Vetlander and Kumla before that. So obviously, going to Masana and being under the shadow of Tony must have been a great feeling. Yeah, look, that was, um, you know, again, step back a year, raced with Tony, just travel with him and, you know, just to see how the guy operated was just you know fantastic um I, I could probably say he was probably one of my best mates involved with speedway you know rider wise you know you kind of you don't have your 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 mates as you know as they're kind of your enemies but um he was always you know my best buddy and you know we traveled everywhere basically so um i think i did 12 or 13 years at, at masana so um, absolutely loved it. First year went there, we won the league and, and Tony was, you know, he was just kicking off. He was winning world championships mm. for fun and um, he was sports personality in Sweden and crowds everywhere we went. You just, mm. you just couldn't believe it. The crowds were just massive. And um, I think the final that year, we had seven and a half thousand people, which in Sweden, that was just unheard of, yeah. you know, you just, it was, you know, Sweden was always known as, uh, you know, 500 people or a thousand people, you know. So, yeah, look, it was really cool. And, and as I say, every track we went to, Tony was the king. And, you know, I used to just, Javi and I were riding there. And we used to go along and just love it, you know. Crowds were just through the roof. So, um, yeah, really cool and real privilege to be able to, to link up with Tony and see how he clicked, basically. Yeah, and sort of like probably right on the note, under sort of like no pressure for yourself because you weren't the number one. Tony was the number one there, sort of thing as well. So you could enjoy probably riding Sweden a lot more. Yeah, look, to be honest, we um, not, you know, we won that many meetings because he was number one, I was number five. And to come down, I would always come down to heat 13 and 15, you know. And man, the amount of meetings we won at home, just, you know, winning heat 13 and 15. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we just had this, this click and off we went, you know. So, yeah, absolutely loved it. Um, rode with him at pool, you know, just to me, he's just, you know, the, the king of speedway, basically. And uh, to, to, be do, to do what he did in, in his era, Mm. where everybody had equal equipment, poles, uh, you know, the checks, all, all those guys had equal equipment. He was just, you know, the best. Yeah, exactly. And I can, I can imagine that it was probably frustrating riding against him a couple of times where, he's, where he was dominating and winning everything. Think, that if, he was, if he wasn't riding, I could be winning this one sort of, sort of thing, I can imagine. But, you know, it was still kind of cool to ride against him. Yeah, look, to be honest, yeah, I, I, I just, you know, really enjoyed it. And then we both had motorhomes and, you know, we used to link up and, you know, have a barbecue and we'd have a beer and mm. whatnot. And I, I really, I really enjoyed just being around him, you know, it was really cool. And, and the way he went about it, like he had a lot of pressure, you know, nonstop we'd turn up, you know, fly into Sweden and I can remember just driving to the tracks and he'd have the press and he'd be on the phone and, you know, non, you know, just the, what he had to deal with was pretty incredible. He kind of, it was, it was very clever the way he went about it. He, he kind of fed the press to start with, mm. uh, you know, and used to do press releases. And, and then in the end, within a two years, they were chasing him, you know, and <laughs> uh, yeah, it was pretty incredible. He was you know, he was the hero of Sweden, basically. Yeah, I can imagine he was a hero. You know, it's unfortunate. Unfortunately, in Sweden, nobody really's followed that on since then. But I'm sure there's someone in the pipeline that can that will take over from Tony's mantle in the future. But um, just looking back at yourself and on the on the World Team Cup front, you managed to win the World Team Cup in 1999 um, at Part of Beats. So that must have been a, a nice thing to to win, especially with yourself 
Jason, Ryan, I think Jason Lyons and Todd Wiltshire was the team that, that day. I mean, do you remember much about that day? Yeah, look, part of it's, it was always a really good track. Um, it was kind of an Australian track. It was, you know, we were, we were brought up on big car tracks and, um, you know, concrete fences, clay tracks, big banking, stuff like that, you know. So, so to go, when it, when it went to part of it, um, mm. it was like happy days, you know. And, and obviously I won four golden helmets there. Um, mm. So, yeah, always a great track. And, and when, it, when the World Cup went there, we had a really solid team back then. Um, I think back in those days, it was four riders, was it? Four riders in reserve? Uh, I don't think it was a reserve. I think it was four, just four, four guys. I think it was um, just the four guys. I think it was, okay. yeah. yeah, yeah. And we had um, uh, we, we we always, you know, we always had sort of four four top guys, you know, mm -hmm. that were in the GP. So that was really cool. Poland, Poland was always knocking on the door, but could only sort of bring three riders. You know, they'd always lack one. So mm. um, yeah. I, you know, we had um, we won two World Cups, obviously Peterborough and uh, and part of it. Mm. Um, really cool, really cool. Used to really enjoy, you know, just getting with the Aussies and and you know, kicking back. And we're all pretty casual lot, but once we put our helmets on um, to go and do the job, and you'd you'd you know you'd always go go that little bit extra, definitely. Yeah, I can imagine so because obviously at that time I think it was the like the, the pairs sort of thing. So you had one, two from each each country in it, rather than when it later went to one rider from each nation in the in one race sort of thing. Um, so I imagine it was probably even sweeter because you were team riding each other, looking out for each other, and all that sort of thing. So it was a bit more of a, a close knit sort of like family really with Streety being team manager. Yeah, well, it was obviously yeah, you know we had Jason and Todd and all those guys. You know, it was. Um, really cool deal it was um i used to really enjoy the world team cup you know to come together and and make it happen but um the latter part the latter years always hard because poland could always mm. you know they always had so many good riders you yeah. know and and they they just had a production line basically so so to try and keep up with them um you know one was a real famous one in in Lesno. Mm. Uh, had a runoff, I think, or went down to the last race with Thomas Gollop. Yeah. Um, yeah. Tough gig, tough one, but um, you know, I'll, I'll take those. I'll take those wins that uh, we had. They were they were awesome. Yeah, because I mentioned about that one in Lesno because I think it was the Aussies were and the poles were like level going to the last race, and Thomas had a, a shocker of a meeting. I think scoring two points, three points, something like that. Johnson Casper's out bike, and I think everyone pencil in the race went to Lee Adams and he go Australia going to win it again sort of thing and all of a sudden he pops out the start wins it and he kicked and he, and he wins you think hey, totally. how's, that, how, how's that happened you know, that's I know I know I, I, I asked the same question at the time you know yeah. suddenly he's on Casper Jack's bike and he, he'd not done much Gollop hadn't done much mm. all night you know he was really struggling and uh yeah he jumps on his bike and just smokes me so that was um that was one that got rained off. So yeah. we we got rained off the night before and I, I, it was a real big monsoon and just absolutely poured. Mm. So we all come back the next day and uh, the track was pretty sloppy. You know, it, it, it was actually good because it produced a fair bit of dirt and that sort of suited us, you know. Mm. But, um, yeah, just... Yeah, I asked questions of the bike, honestly. <laughs> it was like a rocket ship. It was just, yeah, bring this bike out and jump on this and... But um, yeah, always tough. We always had a big fight with the poles, you know. Mm -hmm. It was um, and kind of in the latter years when it went four, you know, four riders in a reserve. Yeah, they just had had a production line. They could just produce them, and we could always sort of put together three, mm -hmm. kind of not quite four, you know. So it was always hard. But um, you know, I'll take those two that we won. That was awesome. It was actually three that you won. Because you won was it? 2001, you won in Rotslav. 
um, in the first year of the new, ah. of the new World Cup, when it was the, 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 the again the dreaded five man races in, in Rotslav yep. and things like that. Yep. So you won in ninety nine, yep. had a year off in two thousand, and then you won two thousand and one, and then two thousand two at Peterborough. Um, yeah, so I mean that that was one. I think that was the one where um, Crumpy got the uh, won the last race, and the polls started throwing things at him because he managed to win it, and I think Krasanyak got excluded in the last race. I think, and yeah, yeah. Again, yep, yep. again, it went down to a last race decider, which this time Australia won. But like you say, later on, Poland got their own back a few years later. But um... totally, totally, yeah. Look, it was always, it was always a battle, you know, and it was always a battle with the poles. Basically, they, you know, they are always, you know, as I say, the last few years, they could just produce so many riders. They had a pick of seven or eight riders they could just put in, you know, and we always just were missing that one. But um, you know. That's the way it goes. Yeah, but then obviously uh, later on, towards the end of your international career, you had like to Darcy Ward and Chris Holder start coming on the scene. So obviously they were getting getting better and more experienced things like that. So I must have thought, well, a bit of a change in the guard sort of thing a little bit, where you had like say Lyon like yourself, boy Jason Lyons, boy C, and Todd Wiltshire for so many years. You get these young kids now coming through, thinking, oh well, okay, we might be able to have a, a decent chance at this then. Yeah, look, look we. Um... That one, that one that I went up against uh, Thomas in the last race in Lesno. I think Chris, mm. Chris was in that, yeah. and Darcy was. Darcy come along there. He just come along for, for support. I think he wasn't mm. racing, but um, yeah, it, obviously it was a great experience for those guys. You know, mm. to be so young and and be racing with us and and you know we that one in Lesno, man, we nearly won that. I promise you. Mm. Yeah, no, I know. I watched on the telly. I thought you won it. I really did. I yeah, you yeah, yeah, totally, totally, <laughs> but, totally. But, but yeah, I was just going back to obviously a bit more individual front for yourself. Like you say, you managed to win four golden helmets. You know, which obviously I think it was uh, three in a row. You managed to do from two thousand one to two thousand and three. I think it was something like that. Something crazy like that. But I've got um, a bit of footage of you when you won your first one um, in in ninety nine. Um, which obviously I think was one of the, the best ones, I think, because obviously you had the likes of yourself. I think Ryan Sullivan's in this one. Um, Tony's was Rickardson in, in that one? Yeah. A, Rickardson? A, a, yeah. a certain Tony Rickardson was in it, yes. Um, but yeah. I, I mean, I've only ever been to see this meeting once in person, but I love to I love watching these meetings because I, I love watching six, six men on a big wide track and all these sort of like you guys are the heroes that I grew up watching. You know, you think these guys were really going for it back then. Yeah, to be it's a really cool event and and actually getting your head around the format's kind of really hard, you know. You yeah. through your through your heat, you got your three heats. If you win two, you can drop your third and stuff like that. It took me a few years to get used to it, but um great track, absolutely love the place and mm. and when it had some dirt on it, which I think this night it did, um yeah, yeah just awesome. To be honest. That was back in the Jawa days, and yep. Peter Johns. Peter Johns was doing all my Jawas back then, and mate, they were bullets. They they <laughs> were just they were so fast and could just I could just keep taking teeth off and and you know normally normally the gearing you'd run you'd just shake your head at but um yeah just um awesome event. Look at the crowd, man. Yeah, exactly. That's just, that is just insane. It was so big back then. It was crazy. But I mean, um, I mean even this is a great final because I say you got your Ryan in red and you got Tony in blue. You in white. Tony too. Yep. Yeah. Tony, yep. And then you got Sam Malenko, Thomas the Pinker, and Mark Laram. So it's not even that's an easy race. <laughs> no, no, no. Exactly. But um, yeah, look, um, it was always a cool one. It was always, you know it was kind of the last big meeting of the year and everybody would just go there and just kind of, you know, kick back a little bit, um, relax and enjoy the show. And yeah, look at me, I'm just winding the thing up on yeah. the outside there. <laughs> Tony's looking, as I say, my, the Jawas back then were just crazy fast. Mm. Yeah. Really good. They go right up the inside of him. Look at that. Sweet as you like. <laughs> ah, how's that? That's so cool. Yeah. Does he get me back here or maybe a little yeah. bit? Yeah, I think I run the outside now. Oh no, I turn back. Sold in the dummy. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. But uh, I mean, again, the final six laps. So, you know, as well, it's 
I mean, I bet you were thinking, hurry up, where's this last lap coming up when you got Tony right with you? <laughs> sort of uh, yeah, just a, just a great track. And when it was like that, when it, we had a little bit of dirt on it, just mm. to go chase and to chase that, it was just insane. I just used to love it. Yeah. Yeah, just wide open spaces, basically. Yeah, it's brilliant, brilliant to watch and that sort of thing. So I think that was part of the weekend, wasn't it? Because you normally had like an FIM meeting on the Saturday and then you had the Parley Beats on the, on the Sunday or whatever. And then you had the yep. Czech Memorial the next day at Prague sort of thing. So you had the full weekend of riding in Checo. Yeah, exactly. Look, I, I you know, I, I really just, as I say, it was a bit of a wind down. You know, we, we'd always just done our GPs and, and had a pretty hectic year and we'd just go out there and just relax and just go racing basically. Mm. And uh, yeah, what a track. Yeah, man. exactly. Yeah. Uh, that's cool. That is cool. So yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, but to be honest, back, back then, a lot of us were sponsored by Jawa and mm. um, it was in our contract that we, we had to do that meeting. So um, which didn't bother me. I, I, no. I, you know, really enjoyed it. Yeah, I can imagine you did enjoy it because um, you were you were a Java factory rider for quite a few years, weren't you? And then all of a sudden you changed to GMs, and then sort of things sort of started turning for you on the individual front, really. Then, yeah, look, to be honest, I probably stayed on Jawa a little bit too long. Um, I kind of my last few years with them, the new engines weren't developing. And I was still using all my old stuff and it was starting to break and have engine failures and stuff like that, especially in my last year. But a lot of the others had jump shipped. Tony was kind of probably two years prior, jump shipped to, to GM. Mm. And I should have gone earlier, but, but um, you know, I always felt loyal to them and, you know, they helped me out. But um, 207 went Jawa, I uh, went GM. Mm. And yeah, that was the year I come second in the world. And, um, you know, just kind of regretted it. You know, I should have gone, <laughs> as I say, I should have gone, I should have gone earlier. They were a, a much more forgiving engine. They work better on slick tracks. Um, the jar was just like what you saw there on the big open fast places, mm. um, weren't an issue, but, um, to try and tame those engines down on the slick tracks was really difficult. And, and GMs could do that. They could do both. They could, mm. they had power and you could tame them and, and get them working on the slick one. So, um, yeah, should have gone earlier, definitely. Yeah, because obviously you managed to break your, I think it was like your three-year world number four sort of sort of like uh, tag you had to so finish world number three in 2005, you know, and then obviously, like you say, we changed to, to GM in 2007, world number two, almost beating Mr. Pedersen to that world championship. But unfortunately, I think wasn't it was an injury you, you picked up at, at Reading that you picked so with, with McGarron, I think. Yeah, it was. yeah, I dislocated my shoulder. And look, I, I was, yeah, I had a really cool thing going, trying to chase Nicky down, basically. Mm. He had a bit of a, a, a lead on us. Um, crashed, uh, Travis McGowan crashed in front of me and, we all sort of just piled up down the straight and yeah, dislocated my shoulder. And um, I think I had a GP that weekend. I had to go to Slovenia to Crusco. Yeah. Um, kind of struggled, but look, I, I'm not sure I would have chased Nicky down. He was pretty brutal back in, in those days. That's when he was at his best basically. And uh, yeah, but look, really enjoyed it. I threw everything into it that year and um you know, just no regrets, basically. Just, um, you know, yeah, just loved it, basically. Yeah, exactly. And I think everyone then expected the following year, in 2008, that the Adams is going to be his year at last. Finally, he's going to win the World Championship. Yep. Unfortunately, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't happen for whatever reason and things like that but still like I said it was a great run that you said that you almost got there. You came close without trying your hardest for that one year. Yeah, look, I... um. Yeah, I, 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 you know, sort of sat back and and Kylie, my wife, had talked about it and we went and got a sports psychologist and and really threw everything at it, you know, that year. And uh, obviously the GM factor, that was, it was like a change as, as good as a rest, basically. Mm. You know, it was like every meeting I went to, I was learning things about the engines and, you know, it really gave me a shot in the arm. So really enjoyed the the you know the experience and um 
unfortunately come up against Nicky and he was kind of just the better man, basically. Yeah, unfortunately, I think he's in his like prime and missile sort of thing going towards this world championship because obviously Tony had just retired, so things like yep. that. So, so it was Nicky, Crumpy, yourself, um, and people like that, then all challenging for this world championship. So, yeah, again, it must have been. It must have been hard work, but a lot of fun along the way. Yeah, look, it was. And, and you know, back then, Nicky was brutal. He, he <laughs> Just was, a little bit. <laughs> he, he wouldn't even think twice about sticking you in. So, you know, to, to be running with him and, uh, you know, pushing him all the way, you know, that's, that's kind of pretty cool. Um, you know, wasn't to be just no regrets. You know, when mm. you put everything into it, and you know you've you've done everything you can. You sort of can sit back at the end of the year and say, oh, no, "That's that's no problem," you know. So, yeah, just um, yeah, just beaten by a better man, I guess. Yeah, and unfortunately it was Nicky Pearson, but hey ho. <laughs> but then at the end of the day, you know, I mean, it took you a little while to get your first Grand Prix win. You know, um, I think you made a few finals in the early two thousands and started getting making those finals and things like that. But it didn't take take you quite a long time to, to actually make a final. I think it was wasn't it Gothenburg in two thousand and two managed to win one. Gothenburg, yeah, yep, yeah, Olivi. Um, again, it was a pretty shitty track. You know, pretty <laughs> mediocre track. Um, you know, it was uh, Sweden. I loved. I love going to Sweden. I had great sponsors, great people. It's a great country. You know, I just mm. used to. It was kind. Of, it's kind of like Australia. It's very laid back, and used to really enjoy going there racing. And um, all of the cool place, Gothenburg's just a great town, a great city. I guess. Mm. Um, I can remember it was pretty ruddy and horrible and. Tony had come off gate one. I think I was off gate three and he hit some ruts and lifted. I turned back and then off I went, you know. Mm. So, yeah, really nice to get the monkey off your back. It was kind of, I was grinding away for many years just trying mm. to get that win and it just never was, it just wasn't coming. So nice to get that one out of the way. Um, and then I think I went on to win seven something like that was it yeah i think i think it's about six or seven you won so i know 2007 was the year where you started winning a lot of them and things like that um when you were chasing now nicky pedersen you started winning quite a few and uh yeah i mean once you win one i I can imagine it's like okay we can we know you can win one we can try and win another one sort of thing and the confidence is there all the way through yeah totally you know and um you know yeah just the monkey off your back basically and Mm. then just march on with it basically and again a lot of my wins were in Sweden on on you know bigger tracks um I used to like love going to Sweden it was just you know the tracks there are just insane um you know a bit of grip I used to enjoy banking stuff like that Mm. um and Sweden was was great for that just big fast you know pretty safe tracks um yeah, I, I love Sweden. Crusco was another good one for mm. me. Um, that was a really nice, big, big, fast one. So, um, but yeah, had some great times in Sweden, definitely. Yeah, because I think you won three Scandinavian Grand Prix. So yeah, you did love Sweden. <laughs> yeah. I, think you, I yeah. think you won one in, uh, was Latvia was another one you won one in. Um, I say you won uh, a Swedish Grand Prix in Stockholm in 2004. Again, another man-made track and things like that. Um, yep. So yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the years, the early years of the 2000s were good years for yourself. It's just a case, I think, maybe you were just against the, the tough proposition, like you say, Tony, Nicky, Jason, Thomas, you know, the, the, the right and Greg... Billy, Ham, Hammond and things like that. You think, Jesus Christ, I mean, you didn't have much trouble, <laughs> really. <laughs> uh, look, it was it was great years, wasn't it? You know, and, uh, you know, everybody's like, ah, uh, you know, now, you know, the, there's not the calibre of, of riders or, or whatnot, but there still is, you know. Those guys have still got to beat a certain amount of guys. you still got to beat 15 other guys whenever mm. you go to a GP. So, mm. um, you know, I look at it now and, and really enjoy it. I, I love watching the GPs. Smarshley to me is just the complete rider. He's, yeah. um, you know, style, mentality, training, you know, everything like that. He is just awesome. And uh, to see the guy race the speedo bike, he's just beautiful, honestly. Mm. Did you ever ride against Bartos? Was he? Is that a bit after your time? Did you ever? No, you never yeah. ride against. No, no. Did I? Well. 
Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I met him when when the Australian GP was on, mm-hmm. and I think he was practicing at Lesno at, at um, Gorjov um, when I used to go there. But um, I don't think I ever raced him. But yeah, uh, yeah look, a great talent, unbelievable, and, and to see what he does on a speedo bike is just you know it's spectacular. Honestly, it's really cool. Yeah, because you you grew up, you had um, was it the Pauliki brothers in Lesno, um, and they sort of idolised yep. you and things like that. So they must it must have been great for you to ride against those guys. Yeah, you know what? This is a great <laughs> a great story. I used to sometimes stay on Sunday, you know, or we'd do Sunday, and then Monday they'd have a, a practice at Lesno, and sometimes I'd stay on if I was flying or driving to Sweden or something mm-hmm. like that. And I can remember going along Monday and uh, my mechanic, um, Billy and, and Murray, he said, oh, come and see these young kids, you know. And I'm not joking, little Piot, no, Piot, is Piot the youngest? I think he is, um, yeah, I think he is, yeah. Yeah, Piot, um, I'm not joking, he was hardly big enough to ride a senior <laughs> bike. It was like he, he should have been on a, a little 125 junior bike. And... I, I went out and I'm having a look and, and man, the guy just screwed it on. Like you wouldn't believe. And I, I said to Billy, what's this? You know, he should be, he should be on an ADCC, but um, that's just pole. And that's just mm. the way they, they, they didn't have the junior speedway back then. So this kid was like 12 or something like that, just wrapping it on, on a, on a 500, you know, it was insane. It was, it was pretty cool to see. Yeah. And then obviously you see how well they're doing now and things like that. You must think, well, I knew you when you were like since day dot sort of thing, you know, and uh, see him riding well now. Because obviously I think um, Piotr had just missed out on the European Championship um, recently and things like that. So and obviously I think, is he still at Legino now, Piotr? Or is yep. can I, can yep. I, I know Piot. Shavik's not there no more? Um, but no, no Piot. but Piot, Piot is. So mm. it, was, it was really cool. Um, we had a under 21 World Team Cup in mm. Mulchera. Yeah. Um, I didn't go to the meeting. I had a go kart meeting with Deck, but um, they both come out. You know, they both drove out to my house and and met up with me. And man, they, you know, they were so. <laughs> when you see them sort of grown up, it was like shit. You know. So yeah, just um, that's just Poland. That's just Poland for you. You know, mm. they 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 didn't have the junior speedway back then. So man, just jump on a five hundred, no big deal, and and go for it. So. And that's why they've probably got all these riders now, basically. Yeah, exactly. And obviously, I think they've got a good junior program now out in Poland. I know yeah. they've got some, got some yeah. junior tracks. I've seen footage of the junior tracks and things like yeah. that. So it's good that they've got that stepping stone system now, rather than, like you said, to put a 12-year-old on a 500 who can barely touch the ground. And you think, bloody hell, how is he going to get around totally. sort of thing? You know, but, totally. Uh, totally. But um, yeah, and I mean, I'm just going back to your first Grand Prix win, I've got footage of, of you winning on that uh, lovely track at Gothenburg. No, you're so no right. way. You, you, you describe so well, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, um, it's just here. And again, it's uh, uh, quite an easy race. I think you've got Tony, um, Lucas Trimble, yourself and Greg Hancock. So, you know, it's quite cool. an easy cool. race. You know? <laughs> yeah, I, can, I, can, I can remember this one, man. This was so cool. Yeah. But uh, yeah, go, go away from the start and everything. And like you say, yeah. That's it. it. Moved over. the start. And then they all just disappear, and then boom. <laughs> uh, yeah, no uh, way. But I mean, it does look like a, a, a quite a hard track to ride because obviously it looks like it's got quite a few holes in it, and it's slick. And yeah, you know, fairly narrow. Uh, Gothenburg, Gothenburg was always a tough one because it, it just had such big long straights, mm. um, and you had so much speed by the time you got to the end. Um, and yeah, if it. Who, is that Drimble going wide there? I think. Yeah. yeah, like um, always a tough one. And when it when it's rough like this, but again, you know, we didn't we just put up with it because we were in front of these <laughs> world, you know, or or in 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 these world famous stadiums and mm-hmm. whatnot, and and you just sort of you know go with the flow. But um, I can imagine the riders now if they dished up those tracks. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, it'd been a lot, been a lot harder, obviously, and things like that. You know, but uh... Uh, look, yeah, again, the bikes, everything's got quicker. I, mm. I, you know, it. Um, I look at the bikes now. You know, with the with the way the the engines are gone with these baby offsets and all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, they're they're missiles, big time. 
Yeah, they are missing. Out. Some of them are actually quite scary because obviously, again, seeing them at Eastbourne and things like that, you know, they go around like rocking ships sort of thing. Obviously, watching things like, like at Swindon, I mean, that's obviously a bigger, yeah. faster track. You get away with it. But when it comes to tight technical tracks, it's a case of it. you don't quite need that much power in the bikes. Yeah, totally. Like, I, you know, I kind of, I, I keep in touch with, I go along with the speedway here and kind of, mm. You know, keep linked up with JMO and whatnot. I'm in the way of everything's going, the development and, and mm. you know, going to Melbourne and seeing the GPs and whatnot. And yeah, look, they, um, I'd love to ride one. I think they'd be absolutely awesome, but mm. uh, they seem like they're really hard to set up. And once you do get them set up and they're in that window, mm. they're just, you know, they're just missiles. You just can't, ca ca cannot have them, basically. Mm. Um, I look at Yunoski last night, you know, he just, it didn't matter if he missed the start, he could just come through and pass people, you know. So, um, yeah, really cool. And, and, and you're never going to, you can't stop development, no. you know, and that's just the way it is. And, and, and you know, that's the way it's going to be. Yeah, it's always the way it's going to be in Speedway, especially when we had the laydowns first come in back in the mid nineties. Obviously, again, that's when you you were riding and things like that. Did you notice much difference then when you changed from uprights to laydowns at all? Uh, look, they were just. I think they were just safer. The old uprights, they you know you'd hit a rut or something, and they they'd flick you off pretty mm. quick. Um, the laydowns were just a lot more docile. You know, you'd hit a rut and you could ride them out basically. Mm. Um, but that's probably one of the good things about Speedway, I think, is, you know, it's still pretty raw. Um, <laughs> there's no electronics. There's no fuel injection. There's no, no. you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, and and basically nowadays, if you want to go and buy what Smash League's got, if you've got enough money, you can, you know, mm. and go racing, basically. So I, I think it's a really even sport and a pretty cool sport in that way, you know, and um, you know, I look at Formula One and MotoGP and road racing and all that, you know, and you've got to be with the right team on the mm. right tyres and all that sort of stuff. So, uh, you know, Speedway is very fair and very even, I think. Oh, yeah, it is. And obviously now with these um, new analyst tyres coming in and things like that, you know, you've got a bit of a variety of tyre now you can choose and things like that. So that would give the guys something to sort of sort of play with and things like that. Was that the sort of thing that you would like to have had when you were riding, like a bit more of a choice of, of stuff maybe? Uh, look, to be honest, as I say, I, I didn't mind it the way it was, you know, and, and we'd all turn up with the same silences and, mm. you know, it was all pretty fair and even basically. But so back in the early days, we used to have a homologated or have different silences you could come along with mm. and we'd have to do noise tests and all that, mm. you know, and there was always, always the unknown. So in the end just making it simple and turn up and go racing and and at the end of the day the best man always won you know mm. so I, I think that's that's the great thing about speedway is um it's raw yeah it is it's 100 raw i mean and it's so basic still you know things like they say there's yeah, no yeah. electronics to it things like that apart from maybe martin spilinski when he tried that one in the grand prix that year where he had the, the little switch you know things like that but you know that's as far as it went <laughs> you know yeah yeah, but yeah, look, it's it's um, as I say, you could go and go to Peter John's and and if you got the money, put a bike together and it could be a, a GP bike, you know. Mm. So um, it all really comes down to the rider and the setup and mm. and whatnot. Well, that, what I will say is, uh, is it the German, uh, the Polish tuner? What's his name? Um, Kowalski. Yes, Kowalski. Yeah. He's got some rocket ships. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's the man. Like uh, I see Wolfie and Janowski, uh, Smash League, and all those guys. You know, as I say, if they if they hit the window and get set up on a at a GP, mm. the speed there, God, is just insane. It's really cool. And even if you if you, if you did you watch the Grand Prix last night from Checo? Uh, I didn't. I didn't watch the whole thing. It was just mm. like a highlights package. Mm. Uh, I don't know if you noticed the race with Smiles, it lost his footrest and he managed yep. to carry on for four laps. You think, hang on a minute, he's, he's got some skill, that boy, hasn't he? That's insane. That's like when he went into that third bend, I could see that something, I could, 
just his style, the mm. way he was holding onto the bike, you know, and you know you you lose your right foot rest, especially coming into the corner. The bike just wants to go straight to the exactly. front. Yeah. So he, he he did an unbelievable job. One to stay on and mm. two to win the race was just insane. Yeah, that, that's just pure skill down to the rider. And, I mean, he's got yeah. such a style that can get away with it as well. I think often he doesn't need the foot rest anyway because his right leg seems to be hanging off the, the bike too much anyway. <laughs> it's, it's, a bit of a, it's a bit of a thing now. I'm not, I'm not a fan of it. But, no. uh, you know, I, I can see if you're getting roosted coming off a corner, they lift their right to, mm. to stop the dirt hitting them. But, um, you know, a lot of the guys just do it unnecessarily mm. really yeah see none of them got quite got lee adam style of sitting in an armchair sort of thing you know and just riding <laughs> it like that. uh may i did to be honest these guys in the gp there you know you, you like i said to you you look at my era and we had all these names you know you were trying to compete against but at the end of the day now they've still got 15 other guys they've got to mm. be you know and it's still studded it's still um you know there's still you still got your, your five or six guys that you got to go and beat, you know. So, um, and Smarshley does a really good job of it. Yeah, he does. He does really, really good good job of it. But uh, you never know. It might be someone who's out and outside. Maybe Yanoski. It might be his year this year. Well, he's going good, you know. And I see he scores in Poland have been rock solid, won the Polish Championship. And, mm -hmm. you know, he he is is looking good and and again he's the package he's got fitness he's got everything you know he's got engines and and whatnot so yeah it could well be definitely yeah exactly but just turning back to your british league career again for the last time obviously you did um after kings and you, you went to ride for oxford where you managed to win your first elite league championship in uh 2001 and i mean that that team was a good solid team in 2001 you had yourself the drimmels you had brian anderson uh jono in the team you know um and oh, it was I think we had Todd then, did we? Yeah, Todd as well. Yeah, yeah Todd and the team. So, again, that was a great all-round package. And you had to go to, I think, Ipswich to win the league, you know, and things like that. Um, I think you needed, a, a was it a point or something like that, maybe, to, to win the league? And you managed to do it in the last yep. race at Ipswich sort of thing. So, that must have been great to lift your first Elite League Championship. Yeah, look, it was always, um, you know... Oxford was always our main rival, you know, yeah. especially racing for Swin. And it was always the local derby, and uh, it was the team you kind of really wanted to beat. But um, the you know the purchasers come in and and you know gave me an offer that you know was was really cool, and it was kind of a family environment again. Mm. You know, it was uh, it was a really nice atmosphere to go there and race, and and again, fifty minutes down the road, so it was happy days um great atmosphere obviously a bunch of australians uh with the dremel sisters in there and yeah just awesome absolutely awesome and and to win the league for for vanessa you know you've been grinding away for a lot of years to try and do it um and yeah to pull it off fantastic i i, I really enjoyed it. it was actually you know really cool we had uh who was doing the track? Um, uh, geez, I can't remember. But again, track was always prepared beautiful. It was a pleasure to go along and race on it because it was always a little bit iffy, the track, you know. But, um, yeah, just great days. Mm. Would have um, Colin Meredith been doing the track at the time? Would have been Meredith? Yes, he was. He was. Yeah. He was. He was He was doing the track and team managing or assistant team manager. Yeah, that's it, yeah. Um, so, yeah. You know, as I say, we went along every week. The track was beautiful, mm. um, good atmosphere, family atmosphere. You know, Vanessa used to bring us towels and <laughs> you know food and everything. We, we'd get spoiled. We were, you know, it was really, um, yeah, it was really cool. Yeah, well looked after and pampered by the sound of it, which is pretty good. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You say no more. Yeah, but uh, I, I won't tell you who beat you at, at Oxford for what the home. Home, like one defeat at home all season. I won't tell you who beat them, but it's a certain Eastbourne team that beat you at home that year. Was it Eastbourne? Was yeah, it was Eastbourne. No way. <laughs> yeah. No uh, way. Uh, I remember. I think I remember watching. Uh, I think it was like a, a Martin Dugard thing. I watched from rerun, and uh, they said that um, the only club to beat Oxford in 2001 in their championship year was Eastbourne. 
you know. But no, uh, I wasn't really, no yeah. way. Well, yeah. Mind you, had, so, tracks, you had Martin and Dino as track specialists, so that was all right. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, they, they'd, spent, they'd spent half their career there. So. Mm. Exactly, exactly. But then obviously after those two years with Oxford, then you um, switched to Paul, where you linked up with uh, Tony again and basically started the huge wave of Paul domination in the British League then after that, really. So, I mean, what sort of swung you to go back to Paul then after some years away? Well, you know what? I, I, I didn't have a club. I don't know. What, what, what was Swindon? Swindon must have been in the second division. Then. Yeah, Swindon was the second division. Yeah, it was. Division. It was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I, I didn't have a club and Oxford uh, had closed. Is that right? Uh, no, Oxford was still running. I think they, I think it was change of promotion. I think the purchases were coming out of Oxford and I think Nigel Wagstaff was going in, I think it was at the time. I think it was a slight yeah, changeover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yep, yep. And look, I, I, I can remember being back in Australia and I didn't have a club and I was like, man, what am I going to do? <laughs> and you know what? It was a phone call. I just rang Matt and said, listen, Matt, I, I haven't got a club. Uh, can you fit me in? And he it was it was a fair way down the road. You know, they, they'd already sort of formed their team. Mm. And I can remember I rang him, said, what can you do? And then he said, I'll give you 24 hours. And he rang me back and we agreed a deal, everything, just straight over the phone. He said, I can fit you in. We can do this. Da, 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 da. And then that was it. We just agreed. Um, and yeah, we went and won the league and won knockout cup and won everything. I think so. Yeah. Um, and and really, you know, had, had an absolute ball to go back there and be linked up to Tony and and everything like that. Um, I was starting to form, you know, some good sponsors and whatnot, and really, really thought that was just going to be me. It, you know, see mm. me see me career out down there. Mm. Um, so we, we did the season and it was at the end of the year, Terry come in and, and bought Swindon out. And uh, he contacted me and said, listen, I bought Swindon. I want you to come back. Um, they don't, they own my contract. So, um, and that's what happened there. So, you know, no, no regrets, but you know, really loved my time at pool. It was mm. so cool. It was just to have Neil as team manager, the atmosphere down there was just incredible, you know, and Tony and whatnot. So, um, yeah, you know, obviously went back to Swindon and then spent, I know, I don't know, another <laughs> six or seven years there. Yeah. You did eventually so, finish your career at Swindon, eventually. <laughs> totally, know? totally, yeah, totally. Exactly. yeah but I, I honestly, I honestly, we went to pool and, um, you know, Carly, the family, we just loved it. We just loved going down there and, you know, um, and thought, yeah, this is it. This is mm -hmm. going to be me till, till I finish. So, um, but yeah, that's the way, you know, no, you know, I don't, when Swindon come in and, and, and you live in Swindon, uh, you know, it's a no brainer. You can yeah. go back there and um, just had great times back at Swindon. Obviously Roscoe become team manager and, mm -hmm. um you know, the rest is history, really. But looking back at that that pool team of 2003, though, that was a great team. Obviously, the team, I think, changed most weeks because, obviously, Matt was so desperate to win the league, I think it was. And, obviously, that, that's when you had the playoff system, the second year of the playoffs yep. thing and things like that. Of course, you had a certain young Antonio Limbach coming in the team and things like that. So, I mean, that must have been great because, again, it's the Masana connection again, isn't it? You, you three guys, all part of Masana, all come to pool now. Yeah, exactly. Look, he... Um, you know, Anton was showing some promise in Sweden and, you know, we were winning the league in Sweden and whatnot. So um, I can remember Matt coming to me and saying, what do you reckon? We'll give him a go. And he actually rode my bikes, I think, for, well, I think for the whole year. He rode um, my spare bikes. Um, yeah, just really, really great deal, you know, great atmosphere. And I, I can't re don't know whether you remember the Knockout Cup. We had yeah. the final in Coventry. And I think we were like, we were down like 18 points or something stupid. Mm. It was ridiculous. I, mm. I, I know the the press guy and a few other guys had actually gone home because they <laughs> thought we were just, we were toast. They yeah. just thought we were done. And we come back and, and we had a 5-1 in the last race to win the knockout cup. So, 
um yeah great times yeah i think so i think you were maybe like something like six or eight points up from the pool leg and then like you said you were like 20 or points down after like nine races and all of a sudden you guys clicked into gear and the way you went and i think you won the, the last the meeting by like two points or something like that yep. you know something like that and yep. i've seen the footage and the track was like sort of like this deep with sawdust and and everything and you think jesus christ those yep. boys didn't have to dig deep to sort of come back to to win it you know and things like that you know so i mean Oh, so it was it's all, it's all good. It was the weirdest, weirdest deal. Honestly, I can remember halfway through and thinking, Man, we, we're really <laughs> done here, you know. And uh, we just got together and had a team meeting, and then just off we went. We just just got on a on a roll, and yeah, I can remember coming down the last race. We needed a five one to win the whole thing, and mm. Tony and I went out and and did the job. So yeah, happy days. Yeah, that's what matters at the end of the day. That little trophy in the cabinet is always just a great reminder of it, sort of thing. Yeah, <laughs> certainly. No one, no one remembers how, how you were halfway through, definitely. No, exactly. Only the people who were there remember that sort of thing. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, if you ever want to know where your pool Kevlar's are, by the way, I own them now in my collection. So I have your pool Kevlar. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've got your, your Kevlar's from that year. So no way. Happy days. Yeah, look like. That was that was a great year. That was so cool. And and you know when when I rang Matt to say, listen, and I had I was pretty high in the averages then. I was I don't know definitely top three or something. Mm. And I said, mate, can you fit me in? He goes, oh, listen, I'll give me twenty four hours. I'll punch some numbers. And when he come back and said, yep, yeah, we can get you. I was like, oh, happy days. I didn't even you know. Obviously, Matt's just the the magician with figures and stuff like that. And the way he can, as you say, you know, the team he put together was never the team he was going to finish with. And, mm. and it's still like that now, you know. He's um, just incredible the way he goes about it. Yeah, and again, it's that, that promoter who wants to win and that will to win sort of thing, you know, and all that sort of thing. Totally, but totally. I've, I've got a bit of footage of um, the playoff final um, against, against Coventry. Uh, I think every final that year was you and Coventry. Um, I think you needed uh, again a five-one with Tony in this one to sort of just just seal the deal, really. Um, and uh, yeah, it's you got Joe Screen in green, and you got Andreas Johnson in in yellow. So I mean, against you and Tony, I think it was sort of a no-brainer five-one. Most people would say nowadays and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Gate four. This is a pool. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, a pool. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, gate four was always a tough one at the end of the meeting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I mean, even looking at the crowds you had there for that 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 night as well. And I mean, they must have been absolutely heaving, you know. Insane. Yeah, yeah. The the you know just the atmosphere is just incredible. Yeah. And again, Middlo to be with Middlo, what a great guy. Just you know, just a karma. Mm. He just could come in and you know. He was just sort of one of the boys, basically. Yeah. Um, but again, again, I think it was also good because obviously the Sky TV was hyping it up to be the big final. I think because I think the first totally. leg, you were you were you were down from the first leg. I think you were like maybe two points down, maybe something like that from from Coventry's leg, and then coming into this one, you were either five one and this one, I think, just to seal it. So. Is this to win the to win the meeting? Was it? Oh no, to win the actual league. This was Heat thirteen. Oh, win, win 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 the whole thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. uh, I mean, look at—I mean, great team riding already. You on the inside, Tony on the outside, you know, and sort of like, here we go then. Bye bye. See you later. <laughs> yeah, man, the amount of five ones we got together—you just never seen anything like it, honestly. Because obviously, we had our time at Kings Lynn Pool, but mm. Masana, you know, we just we pulled the team out of the woods so many times. Uh, just a great guy to ride with, you know. We just had a relationship. Yeah. Um, yeah, what a what just a the king basically. Yeah. Did you ever ride together in Poland at all? Or was it a case of yours in the opposition side? No, never. Mm. No, never. Always opposition, you know. Mm. Um but again, we'd always just meet up sort of Monday morning, we'd always fly from Poznan. Poznan was just the place everybody sort of flew into and out of, you know. So mm. we'd always just meet up there and, and fly into Sweden and do Sweden on Tuesday. Look at that crowd. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Look at that. That's insane. Yeah, that's really cool. Exactly. Really I mean, cool. 
I mean, that was your second championship with Paul as well, because obviously winning it in your first year in British League and then your second time in the senior league. So you won it with two different two different leagues. It's even better than for yourself. I had a pretty good rate down there. Two years. I, I spent two years there and won the league twice. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think you won everything as well with, with Paul as well, knockout cups and everything as well in the National League and the and the top league as well, I think as well. So, you know, it was uh it's a great uh, we time. didn't the first year we didn't win the knockout cup. We oh, okay. um, I remember we went to Berry. We had Berwick, and mm. uh, they they beat us in the knockout cup. But uh-huh. um, yeah, we won the league. We smoked smoked the league the first year, and mm. then um, yeah, to go back there. As I say, I had a good strike rate. Yeah, you did very good strike rate around there. <laughs> very good. <laughs> and, uh, and, then, and obviously, then like you said two thousand and four was the start of your basically um, time with Swindon again. You know, and uh, like I say Terry bringing it back up to the to Elite League with Roscoe and uh, and everyone else there at Swindon. It must have been, like I say, a, a fairy tale sort of thing for yourself. You think, right, well, this is it. I'm staying here now. All the time they're staying in the top league, I'm staying here. That's it. No brainer. Yeah, yeah. Look, to, it was awesome. Um, you know, as I say, I did the year at Pool and thought, man, that's just me. That's just mm. you know, I've set myself up. I'm that's going to finish it there, but. Um, to go to to go back to Swindon, all good. Um, you know, I had my family there, and um, you know, the kids were doing school and whatnot. So for them to be able to come along every Thursday and see me race and whatnot, so that was that was really great. Mm-hmm. Um, good atmosphere, had great promoters, Terry, you know, and and all the boys, and Roscoe as team manager. Um, yeah, wouldn't change it for the world. My, my only regret is not winning the league. Basically, yeah. um, you know, we went we went so bloody close many times. Um, again, we won the league or the, the minor league. Didn't mm. win the playoffs against Wolverhampton. That was probably our best shot, basically. Mm. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of my only regret there. But, but um, had great times, yeah. great times. We managed to win the Elite League pairs twice, one with uh, Charlie Jader and then the other one with um, Lee Richardson. So, I mean, you managed to win a few things with Swindon yeah. along the way. So that must have been pretty cool to win those sort of things. Yeah, it was, but it would have been, you know, it would have been great to win the league. But, um, you know, that, that time with Wolves, we were so dominant and we had such a good team and we just come up against Freddie Lindgren and, and Wolfie. They were just two young kids yeah, um, and just ready to crank it on, basically, you know. Mm. So, um, yeah, that, you know, that's my only regret kind of with, with that whole thing. But, um, you know, as I say, to be able to go along every Thursday and have my family there and, and watch me race, mm. um, you know, that was, that was the best, definitely. Yeah, because I think, wasn't it... Um... Coventry came close with as well one year as well when you had um, I think it was uh, Coventry just turned the corner at the right time and you guys were again like you said top of the league or, or second in the league um, going into the playoffs and you're thinking oh we've got a good yeah. chance here and then unfortunately I think mechanical gremlins at, for yourself at Coventry and a few other lads made it really hard for the return leg at Swindon you know and things like that but I mean yeah it would have been great for you got for you to just top your career off and win the league at Swindon you know that would have been, been fantastic oh, but, definitely Definitely, hundred percent. But as I say, pro- probably the the one with Wolverhampton that mm. was we were dominant. We we had won the league, and and then it just went into the playoffs, and they were just just young and hungry, and mm. um, you know prepared to just throw it on the line, basically. And uh, yeah, that was disappointing, but um, you know that's the way it goes. That's speedway, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. But on but on the Polish side, you managed to win a couple of extra league titles with Lesno um, along the way, along your how many years? I think, was it 12, 15 years you had at Lesno? 15, 15, yeah. So um, it, my Polish career went uh, Lesno, uh, sorry, Lublin for two or three years, three yeah, years. Three years, uh, yeah. Then I did a year at Rotslav. Um, I only did one meeting for them, I think. And then uh, Lesno was second division mm. back then. So um, they came in and I signed for them. Uh, and then, yeah, 15 years straight. So that was awesome. We won two league titles with them. Um, you know, just, mate, what a pleasure to go and race that track every week. You mm. just couldn't ask for anything better, you know. It was just, uh, I class it as the best track in the world. Um mm. And just to turn up there every Sunday or every second Sunday and go racing, 
in front of big crowds and you know it was it was kind of uh, a similar sort of township as is Mildura where I come from mm. um, fairly small agricultural you know a lot of farming and all that sort of stuff mm. um, you know very similar to Mildura so yeah just felt at home there and just just loved it you know and great great people managed to get great sponsors and um you know couldn't ask for anything better but as i say the big the big plus was racing on that track every sunday it was mm. just insane yeah that's actually one of my my speedway stadium bucket lists is to go to legend to actually see it in person because it's it was like a, such yep. an awesome track in a bowl sort of thing very much like a mm. sort of like a bradford sort of sort of s sort of style maybe to it slightly you know and things like that very very you summed it up perfect there very mm. very similar um real pacey little bowl but mm. you know you can really get a lot of speed off the off the banking and stuff mm. like that you know but yeah it was as i say it was just a pleasure the last few years was um pretty hectic because it was grippy it oh, was right. like mad grip, mad grippy you know mm. I, I think actually the year i retired they sort of changed the, the, the next year they changed the rule with the pzm mm. and every track had to be a certain standard and stuff like that but my last few years, it was just crazy grippy. Sometimes I used to turn up and think, oh, you know, <laughs> this is this is serious. So I'd hate to think what the away teams thought. And, and it was all it was all like that in Poland mm-hmm. back then, you know. We doctored the track and because we knew that, <laughs> you know, they had a slick track, we'd make it just extra grippy. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, there's a few times there, a few meetings where it was like I used to enjoy grip. Mm. but this was hardcore it was really full on but um yeah it just great times yeah definitely mm. and obviously seeing the um sort of the evolution of, of the club you know then changing with different promoters and then obviously the stadium coming into a full seater capacity stadium now and probably facilities are second to none nowadays whereas when you probably first went there it was just like a normal sort of polish stadium maybe looking a bit sort of uh, that run down a little bit and and things like that but then obviously like you said yeah. towards the end of your career you got to see this plush stadium that's holding grand prix holding world cups you know and things like that just for fun yeah look awesome my, my one gp or i did two two or three years in the mm. gp there but my first the first year the gps went there um it was just insane honestly and i i, I kind of just i got into the a final i can remember just going into this zone you know and uh, it was just like I'm gonna win this thing whatever you know it was just one of those uh, it's kind of it's hard to explain but uh, yeah you just turn up and crowd you didn't even think about that you just went racing you know and managed to win my first or the first GP they had there um, and yeah it, just like what you said it's a bucket list thing you got to go there and uh, experience it the crowd is just insane it was mm. it's really cool i suppose when you ride in that sort of um against that sort of crowd on a, on a league basis it doesn't really make any difference when you go to a grand prix then in poland because it's kind of like the same sort of capacity crowd then we go there yeah very very much you know like we were geez we were pumping in you know fifteen thousand, twenty thousand. you know we mm. the, the finals i I think the finals were like 22,000 or something mm. stupid. It was just like they were hanging out of the, the, <laughs> oh, they were, it was, yeah, there was no health and safety or anything like that. Yeah. Just try and cram as many in as they mm. could. But, uh, you know, obviously nowadays it's, it's obviously fully seated and, you know, it's, it's pretty restricted, but, uh, yeah the crowds were just it was just a norm basically you know mm. like when we went to the gp if we had a big crowd i was just like oh, we get this in poland every sunday you know it's no no different but uh yeah we're pretty lucky we're, we're, i kind of caught it at the right time when mm. when speedway was you know it's obviously very big there now but um it was massive back then mm. yeah because i can imagine um what was it sort of like that when you first went there? Was it quite of like not obviously having the twenty thousand crowds you get there now sort of thing? Was you getting like a few thousand then that time and like a very small? Uh, it was still still big crowds, but it was communists and mm. all that sort of stuff. So you know you you always had uh, you know had the wall there basically, mm. and and you know their equipment was not quite there basically. Um, you know when 
but it was only a year or so and then they had the money and they could go and buy all the mm. all the trick stuff and and they probably had better engines than what we did but uh <laughs> you know the first the first few years yeah it was it was kind of um it was cool cool to experience i can remember i went to a world team cup down in Zhezhov, mm. uh which is right down south and man we drove there and just to get there it was like a mission so we actually <laughs> You know, you went in, you had to go into Berlin and go through all the borders and all that. You know, you, you're probably talking a two-day trip to get down there. So, um, and now it's all just jump on a plane and off you go. So, yeah, time to change and, and change for the good, definitely. Oh, yeah. And obviously now they have their own workshops and everything in Poland and everything, which obviously I can imagine you had in Lesno was your own sort of like little workshop and things like that. We had all your Grand Prix bikes probably as well as your Polish and Swedish bikes and things like that. Yeah, look, I was um, I was really lucky. I had really good mechanics the whole time I was in Lesno. Um, Mario, my one where I finished up with, he was with me, I think, for probably 10 years or something like that. So, um, yeah. Everybody, it's still like it now. They all got their workshops and and whatnot, and and it was like pecking order sort of thing. So the, the better you, the better you got, the better workshop you got. So, um, but yeah, just cool atmosphere. The way it all works, you know, you just pull your bike out if you want to have a practice. I could just fly in on Saturday, uh, and just say, listen, I need a practice. They'd prepare the track. It would be exactly the same as what it was going to be on the Sunday grippy slick whatever it was going to be um yeah that's where paul and i got the upper edge they're mm. just they're kind of one step ahead they're always got a home track advantage basically probably not so much now i think all the regulations and everyone's got to have a pretty even track but um yeah it was so cool so such a cool place mm. yeah because obviously you had your um, testimonial out there in poland as well and things like that you know so that must have been kind of cool to have a, a testimonial because i think it's a rarity that uh, a non-polish rider would get that sort of thing yeah totally like yeah, testimonials in england it's it's just a common thing mm. but um to have a, a testimonial in in Poland and being a foreigner definitely was mm -hmm. was a you know pretty pretty much unknown and unheard of. Even even to have testimonials, you don't you don't hear of that many happening no. over there, you know. So um, yeah, and managed to get a good crowd and everything. So it was cool. It was really yeah. As I say, if if you're going to go anywhere to watch racing go to Lesno and watch mm -hmm. a league match or, or something like that. It's such a cool place and a great little town, not, mm. you know, really, really cool. Not far from Poznan, not far from Wroclaw, you know, it's really good. So it's quite like more centralised in Poland and sort of things. So you get to places quite easy then. It, it's pretty good. Like I think Poznan used to be an hour, hour mm. and a little bit, uh, hour and 20. I think Wroclaw was at an hour and 40, 45 or something like that. But I think now so, talking to Jamo, there's more motorways. There's a lot mm. of motorways running from Wroclaw. Um, so I think they actually fly into Rotslav now, which oh. is um, makes it easier. It's a pretty mm. pretty nice place to go. And um, but yeah, just get down to Lesno. Hopefully, I'd love to think one day they get a GP because it's just um, it's a waste, really. It's mm. you know to to not have that track on the calendar. To me, it's the best race track mm. in the world. So um, to not have it, yeah, mm. a bit of a bummer. Yeah, but I think I think also the, the, the organisers got so much choice now. You know, all the all the clubs have obviously up their game and things like that. So I think yeah. with Poland, we're not just having like the, the best rides in the world, but they've got the best tracks in the world at the moment and things like that. You know, with 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 choice and all that sort of thing. You know, I mean, with the Grand Prix Series this year going to Lublin, I think it is for the first time. You know, and stuff like that. It's kind of kind of crazy. It's not like the sort of normal Rotsla, Bidgosh, Lesno sort of Grand Prix track. It's somewhere different for a change. Yeah, it is, and and. Yeah, the, you know, the, as, you, as you say, there's great stadiums. Um, you know, you look at Rotslav, I look at Rotslav now and, man, what they did there to that stadium is just mm. incredible. Um, Torren, I, I actually did the first meeting in Torren. Um, so, you know, that stadium's just second to none. So, mm. yeah, just fantastic. Just great place. Great, you know, that. They're just—it's like they're riders. They've just got a list of stadiums they mm. can go to. So yeah, really cool. 
Yeah, because you, you've written both touring tracks, haven't you? You wrote the old tour and obviously the new one as well and things like that. And also, you think you won the 2007 Extra League title against Torin as well that year, didn't you? Yep, had some had some fierce fights with Torin. <laughs> no, you know, we did uh, we did two off two playoff finals with them. Oh yeah. Um, on the old on the old track, we won the first one. They won the second one. So um, that was really great. Um, and then, as I say, yeah, they did manage to do the first meeting at the new stadium, um, the first league match it was. And I think they put up extra money for the track record. And <laughs> I, managed, I managed to get it. So that was really cool. Yeah. Of course, you had to get that, didn't you? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it, again, again, a really, really cool stadium, but a great track too. They, the, the, I think Per Johnson was involved with building yeah. it and managed to get a lot of banking on the track and whatnot. Mm. So, yeah, it was good. Yeah, because I've, I've had um, Chris Morton on the show previous, and obviously he based the new Bellevue on Tor on Torren, which then I found out that Torren's also based on Bradford. The new Torren is uh, things like that. So obviously, when Per was involved with it, Per won his world championship at Bradford. So obviously, they're trying to make it as yep. soon as they could, things like that. So it all comes like full circle after a while. If you think about it. So. Totally, totally banking. Bankings to me, you know, especially the way now with the way the bikes are and how fast they are, mm. um, banking's crucial. You know, you can just it creates that many more lines off the mm. corners and stuff. But um, and Bradford, man, that was a track I used to love going there. That was just so cool. Um, yeah, but get down the Lesno. From the yeah, track. yeah, I will do. I'll try to do that in the future. I'll try and get down there, do like a little Polish tour, things like that. So, but um, yeah, and I mean. Um, Talking of sort of like places like Bradford and Oxford, they look like they're hopefully can come back in a few years with Speedway and things like that. I don't know if you've seen anything that's happened recently. I mean, Oxford now have been um, been bought and it's hopefully going to get Greyhounds and Speedway back there in the next few years. So fingers crossed with them. And also with Bradford having stock cars now back there, maybe that could be for Speedway. So it's all looking good for the British League over here with two more hopeful tracks coming back. Yeah, look, I'd love to think so, but... Um... Obviously, if they come back, they've got to be done right. That's the yeah. thing, you know. That especially Bradford being a stock car, you know, you want you want it all to be prepared nice and whatnot. Mm. Um, the one big thing you got is your national stadium, you know, mm. Bellevue. That man, I I get jealous when I see that. I just would have loved to have gone there, you know, just wide open basically. Yeah. So that that's really great. Um, you know, I'd love to see Bradford back. I don't know how they're going to do it with the way they form that um, VIP thing around on the 34th bend. I yeah. don't know how that works. Well, looking at the photos of it, um, it overhangs, I'd say, a couple of feet of, on the outside of the old Bradford shape and things like that, yeah. but not yep. a lot that is going to cause any major damage or anything like that. Cause I think it's the way it's designed yeah. or something like that, but I've never seen it in yeah. person. So hopefully that won't affect it. But to make you a little bit more jealous, I've ridden the new Bellevue. I've ridden there and it's a fantastic track to ride. Absolutely loved it. Oh, well. man. <laughs> when when I when I first saw that I was like man I'm jealous you know that just looks that was made for me that place it's um yeah it looks really cool it's um would would love to go there and and see the meetings and and whatnot but um you know you got a pretty good mixture now really of 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 your elite league obviously Swindon's gone which is mm. a bummer and I'd, I'd I'd hate to see it just disappear completely. Mm. Um, I don't know what's happening there. I don't think there's much happening, which mm. is a real shame. But, um, you know, you you got your King's Lens and, and Peterborough's and, and Ipswich's, which Ipswich has improved. So you've got some really cool tracks in, mm. in the Elite League now. Mm. I think the only thing that's missing in, in the in the top league and things like that now is just those a few extra clubs. I think it is really more than anything because yeah. yeah. um, you know six teams or was it seven six or seven teams in the top league isn't really a great sort of thing I think to have. But you know, unfortunately, with us losing tracks at a fair rate of knots in the last few years, which is very unfortunate. With obviously, like I say, Swindon not running at the moment. We've lost Somerset. We've lost um, Rye House. You know, and Workington and yeah. things like that. And we need more tracks coming back. So hopefully, you never know. Maybe, maybe in a few years, you know, um, or maybe if you move back over here and become promoter, might be able to get more, more tracks going. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I just, I'd love Swindon. From what I gather, you know, and what I hear, the, the new track that they built is just awesome. Everyone raves about it. So um, to see it just disappear would be a real shame. But uh, you know, we'll keep our fingers crossed that they can sort things out. 
Yeah, I mean, definitely the racing had uh, sort of like changed. I think that last uh, 2019 uh, when they shortened the track yeah. and brought the track in. Yeah. Like that. I think the racing got a lot better because obviously it wasn't it the, the turns one and two kept flooding a lot when it used to have rain there and, and things like yeah. that. So yeah. I think that's now now gone and things like that. So there's, the track's a bit better, but um, still a Lee Adams sort of track though. <laughs> oh man, I, I, I um, you know, I, I keep talking to Roscoe and all the boys and and my old mechanics and I'm like what's going on what's going on and they're like there's nothing there's nothing happening you know so um I, I yeah it would it would just be a real shame for it just to fall you know just to disappear basically so yeah it would be a crying shame especially like I say especially after losing so many tracks previous but um you never know maybe next year when COVID restrictions are, are, are less sort of thing and back to some sort of normality we might be able to get Swindon back open again all being well but um let's hope so Obviously, um, after your racing had finished, obviously with Speedway, you had your unfortunate accident. Um, whilst right, was it much cross you were doing, or was it an enduro event that you did that you did your accident? Yeah, it's kind of like a desert race, you know, like a like a Baja kind of thing. Oh, okay, it's yeah. um, yeah, it's just a, a race up in Alice Springs, which um, is right in the middle of Australia. You couldn't like where I crashed, you couldn't get a a more middle of Australia. If you had oh, really? got a pin in the middle of Australia was where I crashed. So, um, yeah, it was just kind of, it was a bucket list thing I just wanted to do. All my mates used to do it every year and, mm -hmm. and it's always June long weekend. So Queen's birthday. Um, yeah, just went up there and was out practicing and, and stepped off. I can't, the good thing is I can't remember anything because mm -hmm. I got knocked out. So I can't remember my accident or anything, but, um, obviously you know paid the price yeah which is very unfortunate but um a good thing is also that you're mobile and everything you're able to get around and, and do things so the extent of your injury if you don't mind me asking and talking about this at all if you're okay with it um what's the actual actual long-term damage that you've actually done and is it a case of your is it from the waist down that you're sort of paralyzed or is it like one side yeah it's um t t5 so okay. um, T5 vertebrae, that's the one that did the damage. Um, so, yeah, kind of it's bra line, basically, you know, round about there. Um, that's, where, that's where the vertebrae went in. Um, I've got a little bit of feeling in my legs. I can feel a fair, a fair bit. I can feel touch. Mm -hmm. um, can't feel hot and cold and stuff like that. So you've got to be careful in the shower and yeah. warm stuff. Um, but yeah, look, you know, as I say, I, I kind of get around pretty good and set myself up and I can go and do stuff and, um, you know, do things in the workshop and build bikes and stuff like that. So, you know, it's, um, it could be worse. I, I promise you, you know, probably you look at, you know, pear or Darcy, you know, quad, a quadriplegic, which is C yeah. that's neck. Um, that affects your arms and everything like that. That would be really hard. That would be really tough. Um, I kind of look at Pear and think, man, you know, he's in a in an electric chair and all that. That would be a tough gig. But um, yeah, look, although it's bad, it could be a lot worse. Oh yeah, it could be a lot worse. I think I remember seeing you at uh, the last Melbourne Grand Prix, um, standing up and, w and watching and things like that. I think, oh, Lee's on. You could see that Lee's on the men sort of thing, and you know maybe. He could be like uh, a bit like like Christoph Zagelski sort of thing, you know, um, yeah. you know yeah. walking with a frame, maybe things like that. But, um, you know, you never know. Maybe in the future, you might be able to just get that bit further on down the line, maybe. Maybe. Like, to be honest, it's 10 years now. So pretty mm. much is what, you know, what I've got is what you're going to end up with. But, um, you know, yes. Yeah, I, I got a little bit going, you know, that my legs, I can move my left pretty good um but my right one's the problem so but um yeah as i say it, 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 it was bad but uh, it could be a lot worse put it that way oh yeah 100 it could have been a lot worse i mean i think i, I remember the day that it, I, I heard about the crash i know where i was i was at ipswich i was i was about to do a second half there and uh heard it over the tannoy system at the end of the crash and it's it's really bad and you think jesus christ the, the safest man in speedway you know, things like <laughs> it goes does an event and crashes. It's really unfortunate more than anything. Yeah, look at, um, you know, that's just life. That's just the way it just pans out, you know. But uh, the thing about it, I went down, I went down with a smile on my face, you know. <laughs> so 
I went down doing something I love and enjoy and, you know, I'm not bitter and twisted or anything like that. I, I still go up there. I was up there this year for Fink and, um, you know, to, to see the event, it's so cool. It's such mm. a, you know, great event. They've got 600 riders and probably 200 buggies or something, you know, so they don't run together. The buggies, the buggies mm. run in the morning and then the motorbikes run in the afternoon. So, it's a massive deal and, uh, you know, it's really cool event. So yeah, just, you know, it is what it is. Mm. You just got to get on with life basically. Mm, yeah. I mean, maybe get yourself in the buggy, do yourself in doing the buggy then. <laughs> so, yeah. No, no. no. I got, I, it, that jarring would be too much, you know? No. So, but, uh, look like I still, um, I, I've got a four wheeler and I still go out to local enduros and, whatnot and get on the four wheeler and go riding all day and, and watch the enduros and all that so i'm still out and about still involved my my obviously my son's mechanic for uh, the husvana team mm. um and my nephews they all race and whatnot so still involved heavily yeah it's always nice to be involved in bikes in one way or another you know whether it's racing yeah. or building or mechanic in or things like that you know always learning yeah. you know things like that so um yeah, does, 100%. when did sort of like Declan stop riding because I know for a while he was riding for quite a lot I know you rode around Swindon uh, ending up every week on his junior bike and things like that but um what sort of made Declan stop riding then oh uh, he he was he obviously we went through the junior speed we did the junior speedway and uh you know, he had a great little style. He, he was really, um, really nice on a bike and comfortable, mm. but always pretty timid. Um, and then when he got on the seniors, we had a winner series and he was over in Adelaide and a kid ran up the back of him and tipped oh. him over and they both sort of ended up in the air fence and whatnot. And that, that sort of rocked him basically. He sort of lost confidence. And then from, uh, he, he still, we, we, you know, fix the bike up and I could always see that he was always struggling, you know, and wasn't as keen to do it. And I was like, man, if you want to quit, you know, do, you know, no big deal with me sort of mm. thing. It didn't bother me. And uh, we actually went go-kart racing and, and, and uh, it, it, you know, I was more than happy. It was something different and I actually enjoyed just going and I actually got in and had a drive and whatnot. Mm. So yeah, but it just, you know, just got tipped off and just lost all his confidence, basically. So, and then he, he started, we did go-karts for a little bit and then he went dirt bike riding and did a few enduros and whatnot, um, which is cool. I, I, I'm all keen as long as he's happy, you know, whatever mm. he does, basically. Yeah, no, cause I just wondered, because obviously I remember, say, Declan riding in the Swindon Centre Circle and things like that and seeing his name in the Speedway Star and all of a sudden he... he stop riding i just i was always curious yeah. why he sort of stopped really more than anything so yeah yeah no just um you know a kid just ran up the back of him on his first corner and then just tipped him over and he got knocked mm. out and it kind of just spooked him a little bit <laughs> and then that was it so mm. um yeah yeah so this time he's on the other side of the fence mechanic in and uh, you know enjoying life which is the main thing so it's just all good he um yeah, so he's living up in Sydney. Um, he's mechanic king. He prepares the bikes and and does all that sort of stuff. Uh, so he's doing uh, for the motocross team, the off-road team, and the desert team. So he prepares all the bikes, and it's pretty cool. Yeah. I uh, I love it going along and and you know seeing how it all works. It's really really great. Yeah, I can imagine it's quite an eye-opener sort of thing and obviously, you know, just seeing different things and all that sort of stuff. I mean, obviously, like you say, you, you build the bikes anyway yourself and, and obviously he does a bit more probably than what you do, you know, and things like that because uh, of him being yeah. a mechanic now and things like that. But no, it's good to hear that he's, yeah. he's, he's doing well and everything and obviously yourself and the rest of the family are all doing good, mate. It's good to hear. Yeah, no, we're all cruising along, mate. We just... Um... We just want to get this COVID out of the way. That's the thing. <laughs> Don't we all, mate? Don't we all? But um, I'm going to wrap it up for tonight. Thanks, Lee. Um, it's, no problem, been, mate. it's been awesome having you on the show. You've been one of the ones I want to get on from the very start since I've been doing these. So it's been great to finally get you on the show more than anything. Um, no but- problem. Thanks for everyone for listening and watching. Make sure you've caught up with all the other shows. I mean, we hope we've got a few more pencils in uh, coming thick and fast to you soon. So keep watching all the YouTube channels, the Spotify, Apple Podcasts, the Facebook pages. Like us all and follow us all on there. But uh, thanks for your time tonight, Lee. Um, is there anything you want to say to anyone in England or in Swindon fans or anything like that? Uh, 
No, look, just um, as I say, I just want Squin and to get up and running again and, and get back into it, you know. It's, um, you know, real shame, but, uh, you know, hopefully it's not dead and buried. That's the thing, you know, and, and uh, yeah, just say hello to everyone. Just, you know, love to be there and see it all, but um, life's, life's different now. So, um, and just all the best to all, everyone over there. I'm sure everyone seconds that, Lee. But uh, thanks for tonight, Lee. Much appreciated, mate. Take care. No props. Catch up. Cheers. Bye.